momentarily. It's just a few seconds before 7 o'clock. Um, and we at 7 o'clock, Mr. Chair, so uh, we can proceed with the meeting. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, good evening. Good evening and welcome to our virtual meeting of Brampton's Planning and Development uh, Committee. Uh, this meeting will be held through the remote electronic participation in accordance with the Municipal Act 2001, as amended by Bill 187, the Municipal Emergency Act 2020, and an order in council from March 2020, which amended the Emergency Management Civil Protection Act and prohibits organized public events with large gatherings of people. Uh, City Council has authorized virtual meetings of its committees with all its members participating remotely to facilitate the continuation of city business during the current pandemic. Uh, we will begin the meeting with the City Clerk calling the roll for attendance at today's meeting. Members of, members of committee, I will call your name for the roll call. Councillor Santos? Councillor Santos? Uh, Councillor Santos, we'll come back to you. Councillor Visante? Present. Councillor Willens? Present. Councillor Pileschi? Present. Councillor Bowman? Here. Councillor Medeiros? Here. Councillor Williams? I'm here. Councillor Fortini? I'm here. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Singh? I'm here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Councillor Dillon has indicated he'll be absent from tonight's meeting. Councillor Santos, are you here? I did see uh, the chat function that you are there. I know you're having some connection issues, so uh, please confirm when you're present and we'll mark your attendance at that time. So I'll throw it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, City Clerk. Our next item is approval of the agenda. I will ask the clerk to first review the changes to the agenda since its publication of the proposed consolidated agenda on Friday evening. So Mr. Chair, there was a proposed consolidated agenda that was published on Friday and since then there were some additional changes. Of note are a number of uh, updates to delegations. It's on the screen before you. Uh, so in regard to item 5.4, delegations on the conceptual land use plan for Heritage Heights secondary plan, there are eight delegations in total. The eighth person that was added was uh, Peter Miasic from Transport Action Group. In regards to correspondence, item 13.1. Uh, in regards to item 4.2, I believe, on today's agenda, which is an application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw, uh, there are a total of 32 pieces of correspondence for committee to consider with that item. In regard to item 13.3, which is correspondence in regard to the conceptual land use plan, there are a total of 10 pieces of correspondence related to that item in addition to the delegations. Item 13.4 is correspondence in regard to uh, an application to amend the official plan, and that is the second piece of correspondence that's on that item uh, for tonight's agenda. And I believe, Mr. Chair, those are the changes at this point in time. Um, there are a number of delegations, a number of applicants that wish to speak to the various items on this evening's agenda, and uh, um, I have a list of those, and when we get to those items, I will help coordinate uh, those persons to come in to speak to the meeting. Sorry, Peter. So, Ruana Santos texted me. You have her on mute. She's trying to get on. Council Santos? So through you, Mr. Chair, just bear with me here. And there, Councillor Santos, can you? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, thank goodness. I am here, and uh, I, I have one item to add on the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, I've reached that point where uh, does any member wish to add a business item to today's meeting? And I'll go right to you, Councillor Santos. Thank you. I wish to add um, an the item of the development on William Street in Ward 1. Okay, and that's a proposed item report titled Habitat for Humanity GTA. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that coincides with proposed item 5.5. Uh, do any other councillors have any uh, proposed uh, business items for today? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I just wish to point out um, listed on today's agenda was delegation item 5.1 from Jot Vinder Sodi and four, I think three or four additional individuals. There's been a request to withdraw that delegation today. They're going to be submitting a delegation request to a future meeting in September. 
So five point okay. one be withdrawn. Okay, so as noted, thank you very much. So I do have a motion moved by Councillor Willens to approve the agenda today, that the agenda for the regular Planning and Development Committee meeting of July 27th be approved. Uh, I will ask, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you, there are no objections, so the motion carries. As we all continue to cope with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and recovery, uh, the Planning and Development Committee will proceed by conducting virtual meetings to support physical distancing and comply with business uh, gathering restrictions while ensuring the business of the municipality can continue. In-person uh, attendance at this meeting is severely restricted at this time. Members and most staff are participating electronically in the meeting. The public can still access and participate in the meeting by a few measures. Watching this meeting remotely through the city's live stream in playback of the archived video stream after tonight's meeting has concluded. And prior to the start of the meeting, pre-registering with the city clerk's office to speak as a delegation before the committee during this virtual meeting to share your comments and provide your input on a specific agenda item on tonight's meeting agenda. Uh, prior to the start of tonight's meeting, sending written audio or video submissions to the city clerk's office to be provided to the committee for consideration during this virtual meeting as your input on the specific agenda item. During tonight's meeting, submitting questions about the agenda business and recommendations made by committee tonight by emailing the city clerk's office at cityclerksoffice at brampton.ca with your question, which may be read in the public record during the public question period sections on today's agenda. A final reminder for members of the committee, before we start to consider today's agenda business, please ensure your video is off and microphone, microphone is muted until you're assigned the floor, then you can turn both on when you speak. This will help ensure only one person is speaking and at one time minimize other background disruptions during this meeting. Uh, we go on to declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Councillor Vicente. I'd like to declare a conflict on an item that was just added to the agenda for 25 William Street, Habitat for Humanity, GTA. Okay. Uh, you, Mr. In Chair. Least, um, he needs to declare a reason, right? That's correct. That's Thank a you. Conflict of interest. Thank you. I, it's a conflict of interest as I own a home that is adjacent to that street. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Uh, so we now go on to our consent. Um, our next up is consent motion. These items listed with uh, asterisks are the agenda are considered to be routine and uncontroversial. The consent motion is to adopt these matters on today's agenda without the need for a separate discussion on these items unless a member requests a separate discussion. Does any member wish to add uh, or remove an item to the consent motion today? Councillor Bowman. Yes, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions for item 7.1, the 12 Henderson report. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Uh, I was uh, also about to remove it from consent, so I appreciate you uh, uh, moving that uh, forward. Uh, so do I see any other members? No. So is there anyone opposed to this motion otherwise? Uh, so I have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman to approve the consent motion. Uh, that the following items listed for consent considered to be routine and uncontroversial by the committee be approved. Uh, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Mr. Chair, I wonder, yep. uh, item, correspondence item 13.4 is in regard to item 7.4, which is on consent. So if committee does not wish to remove 7.4 from consent, 13.4 uh, correspondence can be added to consent as well. Okay, so duly noted. Uh, so is there anyone opposed? No, so the motion carries. Uh, our next our section of tonight's agenda is a statutory public meeting item. This is a public meeting of the Planning and Development Committee held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act of Ontario. The proposals to be heard at this public meeting are the result of applications made under the Planning Act. There are not proposals of the City of Brampton unless they are specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. We do not have city-initiated proposals as part of tonight's statutory public meeting. The intent of this public meeting is to receive submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Given we may have persons watching this meeting through the city's live stream, we will have present in uh, each of the three proposals subject to a statutory public meeting unless committee decides otherwise. After receiving any pre-registered delegations, members of the committee may ask questions for clarification but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. Committee consideration of the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. 
The city also posted to its website supporting information and documentation for these development applications for public review and reference. We will now proceed to consider the three items on this evening's statutory public meeting agenda. After consideration of these public meeting items, committee will deal with the balance of the agenda items. So our first one is 4.1 staff report regarding application to amend the official plan, secondary plan and zoning bylaw um, regarding a uh, five story building housing, 70 assisted living independent living units and two story medical. Um, and I believe I will hand it over uh, for a staff presentation from Dana Jenkins, development planner of our planning, building and economic development. Welcome, Dana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yep. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of committee, staff and members of the public. My name is Dana Jenkins and I'm the planner assigned to process this application. The purpose of the meeting is to get public input on the proposal filed by CanDevCon Limited on behalf of Chacon Retirement Village Incorporated. Next slide, please. The subject property is located within Ward 8 in the eastern central part of the city. The parcel is approximately 1.38 hectares or 3.41 acres in size and is located on the west side of Gorway Drive and south of Casanova Road. Property, which is outlined here in blue, currently has a single detached dwelling with an access point on Goreway Road at the southerly portion of the site. There are valley lands and open space adjacent to the property, and beyond that, industrial use to the west and residential. Please. The applicant proposes an amendment to the official plan, very plan, and the zoning bylaw to permit a phase retirement community consisting of one five story retirement home with 70 assistance and independent living units, one two-story ancillary commercial building to include medical office, pharmacy, and convenience uses, one five-story seniors condominium building with 60 two-bedroom units, and a total of 121 parking spaces, including nine accessible spaces. The slide shows the concept plan superimposed on the air photo. Four-way drive is shown on the far right, and in the proposed order of phase development are the five-story retirement unit building at the north end of the site. After that, the two-story building closest to Corway Drive, accommodating non-residential uses. And then the five-story seniors condominium building on the west side of the property furthest from Corway Drive. Please. Subject property is designated as state residential and open space in the official plan. The open space portion is at the northeastern portion of the property. Slide, please. Located within the Goreway Drive Corridor Secondary Plan, the site is designated in state residential intended for low density and low intensity development. And the maximum building height within the estate residential designation is three stories. Slide, please. The current zoning of the land are agricultural. <clears throat> me. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes to redesignate the lands from state residential to residential in the official plan. Please. The applicant proposes to amend the Goreway Drive Corridor Secondary Plan, redesignate the subject lands from a state residential to institutional special policy area five within the Goreway Drive Corridor Secondary Plan, with the proposed institutional designation to include residential and ancillary commercial pieces to serve the immediate resident population. Slide, please. The applicant proposes the following amendments to the zoning bylaw to permit a residential, institutional, and associated commercial uses on the subject land, to permit a maximum building height of five stories, to permit a maximum number of apartment dwelling units of 200 to permit a maximum building coverage of 25%, to require a minimum number of parking spaces of 120. Issues identified to date include the following. Any redevelopment of the lands must take into consideration the TRCA regulated area and the existing natural features, ensuring compatibility of the proposed uses with adjacent land uses, 
and integrating the needs generated by the proposed retirement housing with existing and proposed services. Slide, please. This slide identifies the legislation and regulations which will be used to evaluate the development proposal. These include the Ontario Planning Act, provincial policy statement, the growth plan for the Golden Horseshoe, Belt Plan, the Region of Peel Official Plan, the City of Brampton Official Plan and Design Guidelines. These slides, it's an overview of where we are in processing the application. Notice that the complete application was issued on May 7, 2020. The application was circulated and the public meeting notice was issued on July 3rd for this evening's July 27 meeting. Going forward, staff will collect all public feedback and technical and other review comments from agencies and departments and prepare a recommendation report for decision by council, after which there will be an appeal period for that decision. Next slide, please. The final slide shows that the information report, as well as this evening's presentation, can be found on the city's website at www.brampton.ca on the meetings and agendas page. Contact information for me, the staff planner for the city, is noted here, along with the contact information for Eric Mertzu, the owner's agent from CanDevCon. Concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I believe now, in terms of, do we have uh, speakers, uh, city clerk? Through you, Mr. Chair, we do not have any public delegations or correspondence. A representative from the applicant, Herge Johal, is present should there be any questions from committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, do any members uh, have any questions uh, at this time? Okay, no. So I have a motion moved by Councilor Williams to approve the staff report recommendations in uh, uh, was there any correspondence? My apologies, City Clerk. I do see here. Uh, uh, there, there was might not. Be... Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have a, a approval by Councilor Williams. Uh, a motion to move by Councilor Williams to approve the staff report recommendations. Uh, it reads as follows: that the report titled "Information Report Application to Amend the Official Plan, Secondary Plan and Zoning Bylaw, uh, Chicon Retirement Village Incorporated from uh, uh, Kenefcon uh, 9664 Goreway Drive to the Planning Development Committee meeting of July 27, 2020 be received that the Planning Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and a staff recommendation subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application and comprehensive evaluation of the proposal. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Uh, so we move on to our next one, which is 4.2, regarding application to amend the official plan, zoning bylaw, uh, retirement community with the 12 story towers with three story podium wings, housing a total of 518 retirement home suites and senior apartments, a one story main street connecting the phases and providing uh, ancillary personal service, dining, medical, uh, Shelgal Villages, Wellings Planning Consultant, 425 Great Lakes Drive, Ward 9. And I believe it's over to uh, you again, Dana Jenkins, our development planner for planning, building, and economic development. Welcome, Dana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can hear me again? Yep. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of committee, staff, and members of the public. My name is Dana Jenkins. I'm the planner assigned to process and review this application. The purpose of this meeting is to provide information to the public and to seek feedback on the application filed by Wellings Planning Consultants Incorporated on behalf of Schlegel Villages Incorporated. Next slide, please. The site is located in the north central part of the city at the southeast corner of Sandalwood Parkway East and Great Lakes Drive. The property is municipally known as 425 Great Lakes Drive. Next slide, please. The site is approximately 2.85 hectares or 7.04 acres with frontage along Great Lakes Drive of 186 meters or 610 feet and along Sandalwood Parkway East of 126 meters or 413 feet. There is currently a 120 bed long-term care facility located on the southern portion of the property. There are residential uses to the north and to the southwest of the site. Service station, car wash, and convenience store to the west across Great Lakes Drive. Public secondary school adjacent to the south. 
and to the east are recreational uses, including cricket grounds and soccer center. Highway 10, I'm sorry, Highway 410 is accessible to the west. Next slide, please. The proposal in summary is to amend the official plan and the zoning bylaw to permit the phased retirement scheme. Next slide, please. The official plan designates the property as residential, which permits retirement housing. The official plan also includes a policy that will be limited to space outside of designated intensification area. Can I see? The site is located within the Springdale Secondary Plan, designated institutional and special site area four, it's intended for nursing home, retirement home, apartment dwelling purposes and ancillary uses. Slide please. The current zoning of the property is Institutional 2, Special Section 1067. Slide please. The physical components of the proposed phased retirement community are two 12-story towers with three-story podium wings, a total of 518 retirement home suites Years apartment, one story Main Street building connecting the phases and providing ancillary personal service, dining, medical, and recreational uses, and a total of 316 new parking spaces, including surface parking and two levels of underground parking. Slide, please. This slide shows a bird's eye view of the proposed development looking south. Slide, please. Here are several images of the proposed development prepared by the applicant to illustrate the views at street level. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes the following amendment to the official plan. To permit a maximum building height of 12 stories to facilitate an integrated seniors development. The development will consist of three interconnected buildings providing long-term care beds, retirement home suites, and seniors apartment units, along with associated amenities and services. The applicant's proposed amendment to the zoning bylaw includes the following amendments to the current plan. To permit a maximum building height of 12 stories rather than the current five and seven stories allowed. To permit a maximum number of apartment dwelling units of 138 rather than the current maximum of 60. To permit a, a minimum setback from the property line of five meters rather than the current six meters. And to permit a parking ratio of 1.25 spaces apartment dwelling unit, including 0.25 visitor spaces per unit. Next slide, please. Issues to be evaluated include the compatibility of the proposed built form, including density and building heights with the surrounding land uses, compatibility of the proposed housing types and the associated services to be provided with the form. Slide, please. This slide provides a summary of the planning framework within which the application will be evaluated. But legislation and documents include the Ontario Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement, the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Greenbelt Plan, the Regional Peel Official Plan, the City of Brampton Official Plan, and Urban Design Guidelines. Slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the next steps in the process. A notice of complete application was issued for the application on May 28, 2020. The application is in circulation for review by city departments and outside agencies. Notice of the public meeting was issued on July 3, 2020. Upon receipt and review of all public comments, agency comments, and technical information, city staff will prepare a recommendation report for consideration and action by council. All parties who register with the city will receive prior notification when any recommendation report is being finalized to bring before the Planning and Development Committee of Council. On final action by Council, there will be an appeal period during which appeals may be filed for a hearing before the local planning appeal trade. Next slide, please. This final slide shows where the information report and this presentation can be found online on the city's website www.brampton.ca on the meetings and agendas page. As noted earlier, I am the assigned planner for the city. My name is Dana Jenkins, and my contact information is noted here for members of the public. Contact information for the owner's agent 
Glenn Wellings of Wellings Planning Consultants is likewise being suspended. Although I see here that I've made an error in Mr. Wellings' phone number, which is in fact 905-681-1769. My apologies to all on the error. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any delegations, City Clerk? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, there are. Um, there are a total of five. Uh, the first three are from representatives for the applicant, Brad Schlegel, Glenn Wellings, and Robert Anderson, and there is a presentation to accompany Robert Anderson's remarks, and that will be followed by Susan Melito as a public delegation, and finally as from Rick Wesselman as a public delegation. I should also point out under item 13.1, there are 32 pieces of correspondence in regard to this item, and uh, at this point, uh, Brad Schlegel, um, you are in the meeting as a panelist, so you can proceed, and all the delegations have up to five minutes to speak, please. Please go ahead, Brad. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair Medeiros and committee members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you about what we think uh, is a very exciting project. Um, I would like to take a few moments just to provide a bit of context about our organization. Ashtago Villages is a uh, three-generation family organization dedicated to the field of seniors care. Started with my grandfather Wilfred, continued by my father Ron, and now led by my my twin brother Jamie and older brother Rob, and uh, my role is design and construction. Uh, our organization designs, builds, owns, and operates 19 villages across southern Ontario. And over 70 years, we have developed the village model, which is a multi pronged model. And it is, um, first of all, a care model, it's a social model, and it's a research and innovation model. I just want to touch on the three of those for a minute. Uh, care is the uh, cornerstone of what we do and it's foundational and we take that responsibility to our residents very seriously and our organization is at the forefront of best practice innovation. Uh, we also offer a continuum of care where we provide many different levels of care to meet the needs and future needs of our residents and this allows our residents to stay within the village where they have established relationships and receive the care they need despite their evolving health status. It also importantly allows couples to stay together in the village despite often significantly different care requirements. We offer various levels of support through our independent seniors apartments, our retirement apartments, our assisted care neighborhood to support people living with physical frailty, our memory care neighborhood which provides specialized support to people living with all forms of dementia, and our retirement suites and finally, our long-term care neighborhoods. The second leg of the stool is the social model, and that is in contrast to an institutional model. The idea is that it is not just enough to prolong life, but that life has to be worth living. So there is an emphasis on quality of life and life purpose. It starts with design. Our village is designed around a main street and town square, which replicate and functions like a small Ontario town. The main street is the social spine that runs the length of the village, connecting all the various neighborhoods. And the town square is at the intersection of the main street and our main entrance, which is our connection to the outside world. The main street offers all the amenities and conveniences that you would expect in a small town so our residents can continue their daily routines and maintain independence. But instead of getting in their car to go downtown, they now perhaps take their walker or scooter the main street to access the cafe, library, general store, post office, chapel, hair salon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are other important uh, parts of our social model and another big one is being part of the community. Site selection on major roads with good transit connections is important so that there is good prominence and visibility and access. And contrary to common myth, seniors in fact want action and to be part of the community. We believe that they should be kept at the center of our communities, not relegated to the periphery. And as part of being uh, part of the community, the village also serves as a hub. It's a community hub offering services such as fall and hair salon, and neighbors club and adult day programs to the community. It's a healthcare hub with potentially a medical clinic and pharmacy. And it's also a research teaching and training hub with possibly a living classroom partnership with a local community college 
and also uh, research taking place. Which brings me to the final leg of the stool, and, and that's the research and innovation model. The main vehicle for this is the Schlegel University Waterloo Research Institute for Aging, which is a registered charitable organization and then philanthropic initiative by our family. The Institute is dedicated to bringing research rigor to improving quality of life for seniors by conducting practice relevant research, which can be rolled out quickly in order to have an immediate impact. We fund PhD research chairs, currently 10 and growing, and fund 26 PhD research scientists to conduct research in many different areas of aging in order to inform best practice, to integrate into training of healthcare workers, to inform public policy and to direct future research. Lots more can be said about that, um, but I'll leave it at that for now. So that brings me to the Village of Sandalwood Park and the specific topic of today. The long-term care home has been proudly serving the community for almost 20 years now, and we are excited about finally bringing the complete village continuum to the, the seniors of the Brampton area. Building our villages in phases is typical, and two future retirement home phases, in addition to the long-term care home, were always contemplated on this site. There are several reasons for proposing an increase in the size of the village of Sandwell Park. One, there continues to be an increase in the need for seniors care and seniors housing in the province and in the region of Peel, and we are attempting to meet at least some of that need. Number two, we also found that many seniors and other communities have preferred our model of a continuum of care within a village design and found it to be an attractive choice in which to live and receive necessary supports. Additionally, Housing affordability is an issue across the province and building more suites will help to reduce the cost per suite and make them more affordable for seniors needing this type of accommodation. And I would also like to add that uh, providing more density at this location is in keeping with the intent and priorities of the Ontario Provincial Policy Statement and Growth Plan and the Region of, of Peel Official Plan and Glenn Williams will speak a bit more to that in a minute. Um, so. One other thing I just want to make clear is that the future proposed phases for retirement home accommodation uh, is for retirement home accommodation, not for general market. Just like the existing long-term care is licensed under the Ontario Ministry of Long-Term Care, the two future phases will be fully licensed under the Ontario Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, and all the suites will be marketed exclusively to seniors. The average age of residents living in our other similar retirement homes is slightly over 84 years old, very few drive regularly, and we have zero instances of young families living with us. This type of accommodation and price point simply does not make sense for someone who does not require our support and care services. And finally, I would uh, like to indicate that due to COVID-19, we were unable to hold a neighborhood information session like we typically do in more normal circumstances. Uh, this is too bad because we find that most answers to the questions that our neighbors have can be provided in that forum. Unfortunately, and despite reaching out to management at Rosedale Village across the street, arranging an info session was simply not possible given the current circumstances. I would, however, like to say that we will gladly respond to any questions that people may have after tonight's meeting and we'll encourage them to reach out to Glenn Wellings and he will ensure that more information is provided. So I would like to close by saying Schlegel Villages and the Village of Sandwell Park look forward to working with this committee, municipal staff and our neighbours to address all reasonable concerns and to bring this much needed project to fruition. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, the next speaker is Glenn Wellings. Glenn, please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members and ladies and gentlemen of the public and city staff. Uh, my name is Glenn Wellings. I am planning consultant for Schlegel Villages, and I have uh, consulted for Schlegel Villages for, for a number of years on various projects. Um, since, 19, since 2003, when the long-term care facility was first constructed on the subject property, uh, much has changed in planning uh, since that time. Uh, provincial policy has evolved with the introduction of the growth plan and there have been various iterations of the provincial policy statement. The growth plan is a significant policy document first introduced in 2006 and subsequently updated in 2017 and more recently in 2019, whereas the provincial policy statement was more recently updated back in May of this year, May 2020. 
those uh, planning documents, the growth plan and provincial policy statement, each provide a number of key policy directives, which uh, do inform the, the proposed project by Schlegel Villages. Strong emphasis is placed on the development of complete communities. And as Brad mentioned, the, the intent all along has to, been to supplement the long-term care facility with a retirement home component. So complete communities, as well as accommodating special needs housing with a range and mix of housing options, including options uh, for housing for, for seniors, as well as placing a higher priority on intensification and creating transit supportive development. The policy documents also emphasize optimization of development and making more efficient use of land and infrastructure, especially within the built boundary. The subject lands are within the built boundary. And in my opinion, uh, this proposal uh, checks off a number of those boxes in terms of provincial policy. The region, of, the region appeal official plan, pardon me, implements provincial policy and contains many of the key policies that would support the application. The policies of the regional plan recognize an aging population and also recognize associated housing needs that go along with an aging demographic. The city official plan similarly contains several policies supportive of seniors. The city has considered age friendly planning and has also conducted a comprehensive seniors housing study. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna, uh, we've received a number of public comments, so I'm going to try my best to, to respond to some of those comments. There's been a number of concerns dealing with transportation, uh, and I'll attempt to respond to those concerns. Uh, Sandalwood Parkway and, to a lesser extent, Great Lakes Drive have been sized to accommodate higher volumes of traffic. Sandalwood Parkway is a major arterial road under your official plan whereas Great Lakes Drive is considered a collector. The property is well served by public transit, and the proposal in itself will not generate a significant amount of traffic. As Brad had mentioned in his presentation, most residents simply don't drive. They're, they're of an age where they're no longer driving. For the proposal, a detailed traffic impact study was conducted and prepared for submission with the applications. And I can advise Mr. Chairman that, that study is currently under review by city staff. The study concludes that the project will not result in an adverse traffic impact, and there are no operational impacts or significant improvements required as a result of this proposal. Turning to the other concern dealing with uh, public concerns dealing with noise, a detailed acoustical report was also prepared with the applications and that again is under review. The proposal is not a significant generator of noise. In fact, the most significant contributor to noise is the existing traffic. This will not change by the proposal or through the proposal, and this will remain. Other sources of noise that were evaluated by our noise consultant included rooftop and HVAC from the adjacent school and the service station as well as the vacuum cleaners at the service station. And the recommendations of the our acoustical consultant is um, central air conditioning with appropriate warning clauses, um, which have been recommended for this project. And again, that, that report is under review, Mr. Chairman, by city staff, as there are a number of reports. So we're expecting some feedback fairly shortly. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'm happy to turn things over to the project architect, uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members and members of the public. Uh, this presentation is taken from the urban design brief submitted with the application earlier this year with a few additional photographs illustrating similar Slavo villages. Next slide, please. This is simply the table of contents from that report. Table, uh, next slide, please.
This image illustrates the community context around the village that most of you are already very well familiar with. The Schlegel family purchased the site 20 odd years ago and opened the long-term care residence in 2003 with a plan to add a retirement home residence in two future phases. Master plan for the site was approved at that time and a key principle in choosing the locations was its proximity to the surrounding residential community. As Brad pointed out, the Schlegels believe in buildings where seniors have the opportunity to be in community with their families, near schools, religious institutions, sports fields, and shops in order to integrate and invigorate the social aspects of the village. Next slide, please. This is a plan of the site. Uh, Sandalwood Parkway is at the top, Great Lakes Drive is on the left. The existing long-term care residence is in yellow at the bottom. Uh, phase two consists of the first 12-story building linked to the long-term care, and it includes the town center, town square building, that is the main entrance to the retirement home. Phase three is the 12-story building to the north of town center, along with its three-story wings. There's parking area to the west of town center, uh, where the main entrance is, and a Gordon, uh, sorry, a garden courtyard to the east that overlooks the playing fields next door. The ground floor has a wide corridor around north to the south. In the model, uh, as I said before, we call it Main Street. It connects all three phases, and most of the programmed um, recreational dining and uh, resident service spaces are located along that ground floor main corridor. It focuses largely on a main open area we call Town Square, which is in behind the entrance. This is where much of the casual, unprogrammed social life of the home takes place. I will show pictures later to illustrate. Branch Legal listed some of these amenities and community outreach programs earlier that are located on this slide. Next slide, please. The site is well located uh, to public transit for residents, staff and visitors with three bus routes stopping opposite the main entrance. For exercise and recreation, there are pedestrian links to the Dixie Sandalwood Park, nearby Flower City and Chinkuzi Trails. The bicycle path along Sandalwood Parkway provides an alternative access for staff and visitors. Vehicle access to the site is available through the existing entranceway with some uh, surface parking and the majority of the surface of the parking is located underground at two levels. Next slide, please. <laughs> Landscaping. And the plan calls for planting along Great Lakes Drive and Sandalwood Parkway to enhance the street edge. The east-west wings of the ground floor in both phase two and phase three are residential suites, each with a direct access to their own small patio with landscape planting and connected to a barrier-free walkway that runs around the perimeter of the retirement home. The main courtyard to the east of Town Square is fully landscaped, including lawns, seasonal planter beds, a gazebo shade structure, common area patio, and a koi pond. The areas next to the main entrance and the dining rooms are fully landscaped, and the windows uh, along these main street rooms are set low to the ground so that this landscaping can be enjoyed from the interior throughout the seasons. Next slide, please. The uh, standard street elevations are shown in the lower left. The sketch at the top of the project uh, is currently uh, shows the project as it currently is approved in white with the proposed additional density as floor levels shown in yellow. Phase two on the right side is currently approved as seven stories and the proposal is to increase it by five stories to 12. Phase three on the left is currently approved as a five story building uh, with the proposal to include seven stories to make it 12. In between them is the uh, Main Street uh, Town Square. Next slide, please. The next two slides illustrate the project in perspective view. 
Uh, first, at the top, the main entrance is shown linked by pedestrian path to the existing transit stop located on Great Lakes Drive. And below, a view from the intersection of Sandalwood Parkway and Great Lakes Drive. The uh, gateway features on the lower uh, to the right hand side. Next slide, please. Uh, the lower uh, below is a view of the existing vehicle entrance into the uh, long term care at the driveway. And to the right uh, and at the top is a view from the sports fields uh, to the east. As you can see in there, there's a uh, retaining wall. It's about two meters high, or about six feet uh, difference in grade between the sports fields and the terrace courtyard. The official plan notes that high rise buildings may be permitted at major nodes and gateway locations where adequate services, roads, and transit exists. We believe this site, located just east of uh, Highway 410, is an appropriate gateway building location. Next slide, please. Shadow study. Uh, the top two images show the summer solstice at 9.30 in the morning and at 12.30 in the afternoon. And the shadows at this time of year do not impact across the street at the Rosedale Community Homes. The middle two images show the spring and fall equinoxes at the same hours. Shadows extend to the closest Rosedale neighbors properties, but is gone by 11 a.m. or so. Impact on individual properties is approximately one and a half hours during this time period. The bottom two images show the winter solstice, also at the same hours. Shadows extend across the, the Rosedale community but are gone here by 12.30 uh, or in the early afternoon. Shadows cover a greater area in December uh, for longer, but the effect on individual homes is for approximately two hours during this time period. At no time of the year do shadows impact the neighboring communities uh, beyond 12.30 in the uh, early afternoon. Next slide, please. This page deals with uh, sustainability measures. The uh, Schlegels are very interested in sustainable design. There are many areas uh, to improve sustainability in building. The project will apply for a Green Globes certification. This is a program uh, that sets standards beyond the building code for the construction activity, recycling and waste stream reduction, as well as building design in areas such as lighting efficiency and increased use of daylight. Reduced water usage through low flow fixtures and drought tolerant planting, high efficiency windows and insulation and mechanical systems, and improved indoor air quality through the selection of low BOC carpets, adhesives, paints, and coatings, along with a high percentage fresh air mechanical system generally in the building and with operable windows in residential suites. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates four of the 19 facilities operated by Schlegel Villages. Um, just draw your attention to the upper uh, right uh, left corner, which is nearby at the uh, village of Erin Meadows in Mississauga. It was opened recently last year and is a 12 story uh, structure. Um, and it's near enough by that you might wanna drop by and have a look. Next slide, please. The next series are simply photographs uh, illustrating the facilities. This is a typical main entrance at Town Square. Next slide, please. This is an exterior sh shot of a newly completed facility out in Whitby called Taunton Mills. Uh, the uh, residents moved in here in December and uh, they're just finishing up the landscaping there now. Next slide, please. This is a typical gazebo of the type that you might find at Sandalwood in the courtyard. Next slide. This is a uh, koi pond that's in the process of being completed. Uh, you can see the fencing around it. Um, there would be a similar facility at Sandalwood. Next slide, please. 
This illustrates the um, perimeter walkway and the court, uh, the uh, patios from the ground floor residence suites, uh, typical for most of the perimeter of the facility. Next slide, please. This is just a shot of a dining room, with the emphasis here being uh, connections to the outdoors uh, in all seasons. Next slide, please. This is a, um, a lounge and a second floor assisted living uh, area. There's lots of visual connections here to the exterior on the left, to the town square in the center uh, of the shot. And if you look low in the right hand side, you can see a connection down to Main Street where there's a, a young woman walking down the hallway there. Next slide, please. This is a fireside lounge and pub overlooking the main entrance. Next slide, please. This is a room we call the town hall. It's a large multi-purpose space used for residents' meetings and for presentations. And you can see here that they're setting up for movie night. Next slide, please. There are general stores along Main Street. And the more recent facilities have post office boxes in them for residents uh, and for visitors. Next slide, please. It's an example of a Main Street hobby shop uh, where they do uh, craft programs and cooking demonstrations. Next slide, please. This is the entrance to a health center, which has become more common with the facilities. And in Sandalwood, the proposal is to have it located in the link between the long-term care, existing long-term care, and the phase two 12-story uh, tower. Next slide, please. This is a typical interior residential corridor. We try wherever possible to place windows at the ends of these corridors. The daylight is a focus and it helps to lift the quality of these uh, long interior corridors. Next slide, please. Mr. Anderson, it's Peter. I wonder if you can wrap up because you've uh, well extended your five minutes. All right, uh, I'll end here. This is an image at, um, at Etobicoke of the main town square. You can see um, in it, um, there's a, a uh, shot is taken from the cafe across the way. On the left is the library, the uh, dining room is to the right and there's a, a wine bar there. Behind the gazebo is the second floor lounge that I talked about that is connecting the, the assisted care living floor down to the main floor so that there's those folks can who can't generally get down to Main Street and can nevertheless participate in the comings and goings and enjoy any kind of musical presentations that are there. I'd like to thank the uh, chairman and committee members and members of the public. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the next uh, delegation is from, a, I believe, a resident, uh, Susan Melito. Uh, Susan, you are in the meeting. Please unmute your microphone and you have five minutes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I have a question. Sorry, I'll overlook Councillor Singh. Yes, Councillor Singh, usually after the delegations, I'll acknowledge you and you can ask your question to the delegations. My, my question was for the, the delegation that just finished. So do I still wait for the next one? Uh, City Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we normally do wait, but if it's a question of a technical nature on the proposal, then perhaps it could be asked now if it's a, a very uh, strict Yeah, it is. it's just brief. It's uh, how many jobs uh, can we expect uh, a new um, uh, components to yield? So, Mr. Anderson, can you answer that question about how many jobs the proposal is expected to generate? Uh, I, I defer to, to to Brad Schlegel if he's still on the line. Mr. Schlegel? I can, I can give you an answer. The facilities generally uh, employ several hundred employees because it's an operation that uh, they go um, around the clock 24 7 and three different shifts. So there are approximately <coughs> um, new employees to the facility. 
Okay, thank you. That was it. Yeah, this is it's Brad Schlegel here. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to jump in there. Um, yeah, we currently employ um, around 125 uh, individuals with a long term care home. Um, and for the next two phases, that would be an, approximately another 325 jobs, uh, healthcare jobs, um, well paid. Um, Union jobs, and uh, so yeah, we are uh, a major employer for sure. Thank you, and apologies to Rick for interrupting. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Then the next delegation is Susan Melito. Susan, I'm unmuting your microphone. Please go ahead. Hello, committee members and guests. I am here this evening to speak on behalf of Condominium Number PVL. CC 770 phase 4B, which is part of the Rosedale Village Adult Lifestyle Community located directly across the street from the site of the proposed amendment application by Schlegel Villages. My name is Susan Melito and I am a resident of Rosedale Village. Initially, I would like to say that this is an inappropriate time for a zone amendment, which would allow for the construction of two 12 story apartments in an already established area of Brampton. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, it is very difficult to communicate effectively with all residents who could be affected by this proposed amendment. Normally we could have held meetings, had petitions signed and attended in person public meetings of the Planning and Development Services Committee. The construction of these 12 story apartment buildings would not be in keeping with the other nearby structures and would change the whole ambience of the area. They would overlook many homes and deteriorate real estate values. Several years ago, a project to develop high rise condo apartments on the corner of Sandalwood and Conestoga was abandoned due to the successful efforts of area residents. The developer replaced it with condo townhomes, which are more favorable to the area. The addition of 512 retirement street suites and apartments and the traffic associated with the additional capacity would be significant in an area which already has high traffic volumes due in part to Trinity Common, a large outdoor shopping center located just south of the proposed expansion. Sandalwood and Great Lakes is already one of the most dangerous intersections in Brampton. We are also looking at significantly more traffic when the sports complex at the Brampton Soccer Center is completed. There will be increased risk to the children who attend the three schools in the area. Great Lakes, St. Isaac Dogues and Harold Braithwaite not to mention the worshipers at the mosque on Great Lakes, where there is already a parking problem at worship times and times when parents are picking up and dropping their children at the three schools. The plan calls for 312 parking spaces in total, which is not sufficient for the additional 512 units. There is already a parking problem at the facility and visitors are forced to park at the high school. According to the site plan, there will only be one entrance to the facility from Great Lakes Drive. There could be a possibility of up to 800 people residing in the two towers plus staff, all coming and going in vehicles. Will one entrance be enough? There is also concern around exclusivity of the 12 story buildings to senior residents. If the towers are not fully occupied by seniors, could they then be leased to other age groups? Most seniors have mobility issues and the, no, and the new buildings will be 12 story towers. In case of a fire in the building or an explosion at the gas station directly across the street, seniors cannot be evacuated safely from 12 story towers. The operation of for-profit 
retirement and long-term care facilities is already under scrutiny during this pandemic. The construction of two 12-story apartment buildings looks like a money grab by the developer. I can only speak for myself, but I don't think anyone is opposed to the development of this area into a seniors living facility. Hopefully they can come up with a better plan, more conducive to an area with already established zoning bylaws and existing traffic problems. Thank you. Thank you. The next and final delegation is from uh, Rick Wesselman. Mr. Wesselman, please proceed. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Medeiros, uh, councillors and staff. Um, thank you for this opportunity to add, uh, add some more color to the Villages of Rosedale formal written response regarding the application of Schlegel, Schlegel Villages for an official uh, plan amendment and a zoning change to the lands known as 45 Great Lakes Drive. For those of you who don't remember me from previous delegations, uh, my name is Rick Wesselman. I'm the chairman of the board of the Villages of Rosedale. Um, the Villages of Rosedale is Brampton's first planned seniors community and is located directly north of the subject lands. There are currently 1,202 homes um, within the villages with a mix of uh, detached, semi-detached townhomes and mid-rise apartment buildings. Um, these units are occupied by approximately 2,000 residents um, by the end of the year, another 53 uh, homes will be, uh, will be completed. The developer plans on constructing an additional 298 detached or townhome units within the final, with the final population anticipated to be approximately um, 2,600 uh, um, residents. The villages of Rosedale is opposed to the Schlegel application in its current form, but this is not simply a not in my backyard issue. Um, as a planned seniors community, we acknowledge the need for more quality senior housing within the city and have watched with interest as the city developed its seniors housing study that culminated in last year's report. Um, we also anticipate that the development of the independent living, assisted living and long-term care facilities in such close proximity um, will provide a wonderful opportunity to Rosedale residents who are no, no longer able to live within their current homes. The first model homes within the villages of Rosedale were constructed some 27 years ago. And since 1993, there has been an understanding as to the character and density of the surrounding community. This understanding was ratified in 2003 with the existing uh, OPA and uh, zoning bylaw. The villages of Rosedale believes that the policies detailed in the provincial policy, policy statements, the growth plan for the greater Golden Horseshoe, the region of uh, Peel official plan and the city of Brampton plan do not fit the long, long-standing character of the neighborhood. The villages of Rosedale are opposed to the extreme densification of the present application um, for the following reasons. So aside from the apartment buildings uh, um, currently in Rosedale, which themselves were subject to heavy scrutiny at the time for being, uh, for being just three stories, there is nothing in the surrounding community that approaches the height of the proposed 12-story buildings. For 27 years, the homeowners within Rosedale have been purchasing with the awareness of the development standards for the community established by the OPA and zoning bylaw. The twin 12-story st buildings uh, will tower over residential properties uh, in the villages, um, causing uh, sun blockage and general loss of property enjoyment. The intersection at uh, Sandalwood, Great Lakes and Via Rosedale is already heavily congested. Um, the addition of over 500 units in the proposed development in combination with vehicular requirements of support staff and other commercial traffic will only worsen the situation. Um, the majority of the remaining units in Rosedale, um, 342 still to be occupied, are in close proximity of the lands. Um, the completion of the villages may be delayed as a result of negative perceptions of the neighboring uh, twin 12-story buildings uh, if approved. The Villages of Rosedale, however, is prepared to support the development of a five and seven story buildings as per the City of Brampton zoning bylaw versus a 12 story limit contemplated in the OPA, providing long standing issues at the intersection of uh, Sandalwood Parkway, Great Lakes, and Via Rosedale are addressed. These changes would not only benefit the seniors within Rosedale, but also the seniors and staff in the uh, Schlegel uh, Villages development. So the first of these being the interse intersection congestion. 
Um, traffic turning on to Sandalwood uh, from Great Lakes already presents issues for Rosedale issues, Rosedale residents trying to access exit the community. An advanced green light should be provided for traffic traveling south from via Rosedale. Um, second being speeding. Um, traffic rushing to and from the 410 it needs to be slowed down. Sandalwood in the vicinity of the intersection should be designated as a community safety zone with reduced speed limits and photo radar cameras installed. Third being safety. In the rush to get to, uh, to Highway 410 and return home, vehicles continuously run the, uh, the red, uh, red, run the lights there and have caused many serious accidents. Red light cameras need to be installed at the intersection. Um, lastly being noise. The villages of Rosedale has had a petition into the city of Brampton for the replacement of the Dixie to via, via Rosedale noise wall as is happening elsewhere in the city. The petition was initiated in November of 2018 and has been bounced around departments uh, within the city and at the moment appears to be uh, stalled based on the requirement uh, for an acoustic report. Um, it was surprising as well as disappointing that uh, to see that the city was already in possession of acoustic report prior to the position, uh, petition being made. The report states that the homes along Santa would clearly exceed the, the 60 DBA threshold to qualify for the requirements outlined in the local improvement regulations and the city, city of Brampton's noise wall policy. Um, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you may have. Mr. Chair, that concludes the delegations for this item. Uh, thank you very much. I do, Councillor Singh, uh, do you have another question or was that from the previous uh, request? That was for the previous request. Okay, thank you very much. As I don't see any further uh, members of the committee, I do have a motion moved by Councillor Singh to approve the staff report recommendations and receive all related delegations and correspondence that the report titled Information Report Application to Amend the Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw from Shelgo Villages Incorporated uh, Wellings Planning Consultants Incorporated for 25 Great Lakes Drive, Ward 9, to the Planning Development Committee meeting of July 27, 2020, be received, and that Planning and Building Economic Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning and Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and a staff recommendation subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application, a comprehensive evaluation of the proposal, and that the delegation's correspondence be re by received. Uh, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you, there are no objections to so the motion carriers. Statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Uh, we go to item 4.3, application to amend zoning bylaw and draft uh, subdivision Glenshore and investments, uh, 5203 Old Castlemore Road, north of Castlemore Road and west of Highway 50. Uh, and uh, I hand it over now to uh, Mark Michniak of Development Planner, Planning, Building and Economic Development. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, good evening. Uh, chair, committee members, staff, members of the public. My name is Mark Mishniak and I'm a planner assigned to process and review the subject application. Uh, the purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application uh, filed by MHBC Planning on behalf of Glenshore Investments Incorporated. Next slide, please. Uh, the subject property is located within Ward 10, the eastern part of Brampton, is located north of Castlemore Road and west of Highway 50. Next slide. The applicant is proposing an industrial slash commercial development. The applicant proposes the creation of 10 blocks, of various sizes to accommodate a variety of business and industrial uses. The draft plan of subdivision is required to create the necessary lots and blocks for this development and a zoning bylaw amendment will permit the proposed uses. Next slide. This map shows from 240 meters of the proposed development. Owners of these properties would have received notice by direct mail with respect to the proposal. Notice was also provided in the Brampton Guardian newspaper and on the City of Brampton website. Next slide. Surrounding land uses include, to the north, across Old Castlemore Road, there are lands in agricultural use with single detached dwellings. To the east, Highway 50 runs along the entire length of the property which marks the boundary with the city of Vaughan. Across Highway 50, there is a large warehouse facility and railway terminal. There is a gas station located in the southeast corner of the intersection with Castlemore Road. To the south, 
directly across Castlemore Road, there are vacant lands in agricultural use, and further south, there is an existing low density residential neighborhood. To the west, there are vacant lands in agricultural use, and further west, there are single detached dwellings on estate sized lots. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to permit four industrial slash commercial blocks, one stormwater management facility, one valley land block and associated buffer block, two blocks for future development and two public roads. Next slide, please. Uh, the concept plan demonstrates potential layout for the site, including building location and orientation, parking, driveways, loading areas, landscape areas, and side locks. Concept plan is intended to assist staff in evaluating the proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, the property is designated business corridor in open space in the official plan. An amendment to the official plan is not required. Next slide. Property is designated mixed commercial slash industrial and valley land in the Bram East block plan 41-1. An amendment to the block plan is not required. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the block plan. Uh, the other one was a secondary plan. Uh, amendments to the block plan and the secondary, secondary plan are not required. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the subject property is currently zoned agricultural in the zoning bylaw. Uh, this only permits agricultural uses and single detached dwellings. Uh, an amendment to the zoning bylaw will be required in order to permit the proposed uses. Uh, there are a number of issues that staff are monitoring on this file. Uh, determining the limits of the natural heritage feature and appropriate buffer areas and setbacks. Access to the site, including the proposed access to Highway 50 and Old Castlemore Road. Uh, integration of the site with surrounding land uses. Circulation patterns within the site for both vehicles and pedestrians. And the gateway features at the corner of Castlemore Road and Highway 50. Next slide, please. This slide shows where staff are in the review of the application. The application has been circulated to city departments as well as other agencies for technical comment. Notice of the public meeting was given to property owners in the vicinity of the property, published in the newspaper and on the city's website. Uh, we are now at the public meeting stage. Many members and staff are here to listen to any feedback. Uh, after tonight's public meeting, comments received from city departments, agencies, members of the public, and matters raised through public delegations will be reviewed and evaluated. The proposal will be further assessed against the provincial policy statement, growth plan, regional official plan, and the city's official plan and secondary plan. Once the analysis and evaluation is complete, staff will return to the planning and development committee with a recommendation report. The recommendation report will address all matters raised by members of the public, external agencies, and other city departments. Anyone that provided their contact information with respect to this application will be advised when the recommendation report will be considered by the committee. Once city, city council makes a decision on the application, there is an opportunity to appeal the decision to the local planning appeal tribunal. Next slide, please. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online. The presentation will be online shortly. Again, my name is Mark Mishniak and my contact information is posted on the screen. Also on screen is contact information from the applicant, Oz Kamel of MHBC Planning. Thank you, and this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, we do not have any delegations. Uh, Melinda McElroy and Oz Kamel, uh, on behalf of the applicant, are present in, in the event there are any questions. There is a pre-recorded presentation that the applicant has put together in the, in the form of a video, and we will play that now for committee's uh, information. Good evening, and welcome to the public meeting for the proposed development at 5203. Old Castlemore Road. My name is Melinda McCurry and I'm accompanied by Oz Kamal from MHBC Planning. And on behalf of our client, Glenshore Investments Inc., we will be providing a presentation to inform the public on the proposal and supporting applications submitted for the subject plan or draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendments. 
I will start by providing a brief overview of the policy and regulatory framework that has informed the design of the proposal. The subject lands are located within the employment area in the City of Brampton official plan and are specifically designated as business corridor and open space in Schedule A. The business corridor permits various employment uses, including industrial and commercial. The open space designation on the western portion of the subject lands represents the valley land and water course corridor associated with Rainbow Creek. The subject lands are within the Bram East Secondary Plan area and are identified as mixed commercial industrial and valley land. Mixed commercial industrial lands are intended to attract a range of office industrial and commercial uses and shall be planned in accordance with the business corridor policies of the official plan. The City of Brampton Zoning Bylaw currently zones the subject land as agricultural land. The proposal. The draft plan of subdivision is shown here. As you can see, there are four development blocks proposed for industrial and commercial uses. The blocks fronting Castlemore Road are proposed to have commercial uses in closer proximity to the existing residential to the southwest, Block 1 and 4, and to act as a buffer to the industrial blocks proposed to the north, Block 2 and 3. There are two public roads proposed to serve the site, Street A and Street B. There is a stormwater management block central to the site, Block 6. There is a natural heritage block on the western limits of the property, which includes the lands associated with Rainbow Creek. This block is identified as open space, Block 7. Block 8, 9, and 9A represent the 10 meter buffer to this feature. These blocks will ultimately be conveyed to the city to ensure the long-term preservation of this feature. There are remnant pieces of land identified along the western limits that are outside of the required environmental buffer that are identified as future development blocks, Block 5 and 5A. The concept plan is shown here and provides more context with regards to the anticipated build-out of the future development. Approximate building footprints for six buildings along with drive aisles, parking, and landscaping are identified in the concept plan. The site has been designed to ensure large truck movements can be accommodated given the primarily industrial nature of the proposed subdivision. Appropriate landscaping is proposed in accordance with the secondary plan with six meter landscape buffers to provide screening along Highway 50 and a gateway feature at the southeast corner of the site. This is a concept for the purposes of the application and any future development within the proposed block in the draft plan subdivision would be subject to site plan approval. The zoning bylaw amendment is required to rezone the subject lands from agricultural land to industrial business or MBU in order to bring the zone category into alignment with the official plan and secondary plan designation. It is also required to allow for site specific permissions for additional permitted uses and variations to the standard zone regulations for lot width, setback, building height, landscaped open space, outside storage, lot area, lot coverage, and floor space index. It is our opinion that the plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment conform with the applicable policy framework and serve to implement the intent of the official plan for the business corridor lands and secondary plan for mixed commercial industrial lands. The proposal will support continued employment and economic growth in the city of Brampton. Thank you for listening to our presentation this evening. We are happy to respond to any questions. Our contact information has also been included if there are any questions that arise following this meeting for those unable to attend the virtual session. Mr. Chair, that concludes the presentation. Uh, there are no more delegations or correspondence. Thank you very much. So I do not see any 
questions on the board. So I will, uh, I have a motion moved by Councillor Singh to approve the staff report recommendations and receive all related uh, delegations. Uh, that the report titled Information Report Application to Amend the Zoning Bylaw and Proposed Draft Plan of Subdivision Glenshore Investments Incorporated, uh, MHBC Planning and Urban Design and Landscape Architecture 5203 Old Castlemore Road to the Planning Development Committee meeting of July 27, 2020 be received and that Planning and Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning and Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and the staff recommendations subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application and comprehensive evaluation of the proposal and that the delegations be received. Is there anyone who opposed to the motion? Uh, otherwise, uh, your vote will count in the affirmative. No, okay. Uh, we go on to delegations, uh, and I believe uh, delegation 5.1 is no longer uh, required. Uh, and we go now then on to, uh, I believe 5.2 we've done, 5.3 is done. And now we go to delegations 5.4, City Clerk, I'll hand it back to you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So item 5.4 are delegations regarding the Heritage Heights secondary plan. And uh, in accordance with the council's procedure bylaw before hearing delegations, there's an opportunity for a presentation. Identified on tonight's agenda is uh, present staff presentation 6.1. So I'll turn the floor over to Andrew McNeil and uh, he will be leading a presentation uh, this evening. So I'll make Andrew the presenter. Um, And after the staff presentation, um, there is, I believe, eight delegations uh, on this particular item. Great. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear all right? Yes, we can hear you, Bob. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Peter. So, it's uh, Bob Bierke, Director of Policy Planning. Uh, so, I'm uh, here with uh, Andrew McDeal, who is the uh, staff lead on the development of the Heritage Heights Secondary Plan, uh, and Anand Bellroom, a Senior Policy Planner, as well as our consultants, Ian uh, Lockwood uh, from Tool Design and Andrea. Uh, Astrodka, uh, who is also from Tool Design. So I just wanted to uh, give a, a brief introduction as we, we go through this. Andrew, you can advance the slides a couple. Uh, and just talk about, this is really a really important moment uh, for us. I think it's really a testament to what can uh, be developed uh, when we take a, a fresh approach to uh, uh, and a strong vision to, to looking at the development areas of the city and uh, really looking at the 2040 vision and, and how we can uh, see that happen on the ground. This uh, process, as you'll hear in the building on the uh, uh, May uh, 25th uh, council workshop, really was a very engaged process with landowners, uh, stakeholders, and a lot of other key players as we uh, built uh, this, this, um, this vision into a, a, a sort of a draft plan, the concept plan that you've got before you. Um, so we'll be going through that background. There is an interim control bylaw, I think, as you know, for many years from 2003 to 2020, uh, which included a moratorium on development for the shale resources. Um, that is now in, in uh, process to, to work through the, the regional amendments to delete that. And uh, we're now working through the uh, dynamics of the GTA West corridor planning and uh, that is, as you know, a, a key part of what we've uh, looked at through this through this process. And then, Andrew, yeah. The other thing to bear in mind is in this process, we've also really taken to heart and, and incorporated the other key initiatives that Council has been working on to inform the work. So that's including things like the Vision Zero framework, the healthcare emergency, uh, climate emergency, uh, community energy and emissions reduction plan, 
uh, climate mitigation strategy uh, and all of the work we're doing around housing and affordability and uh, urban community hubs. Um, in addition to that, really engaging with the complete streets study and the way we ruse roads uh, and uh, to support different modes of transportation, uh, as you'll see, is all very evident in, in this plan. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to an end to go through some of the background uh, on the, the plan we have before you this evening. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so Heritage Heights um, has been a notorious start stop process with the city of Brampton's planning department since about the early 2000s. Recently council directed staff to re-engage in the planning for this area. Um, and as, as part of any good planning process, we held a charrette. So our first charrette informed phase one, which was a vis visioning portion for the project. It was held in, back in November of 2019 at Cassie Campbell, and this was really an opportunity to engage with residents, landowners, developers, and other stakeholders. As you can imagine, what we heard uh, was not dissimilar to what we heard during the Brampton 2040 vision engagement. And I won't read this entire slide, but participants at the time wanted a sustainable place that supported their health, well-being, uh, a place that was walkable, responsible to changes in climate, affordable, and economically competitive. Next slide. One of the things that we were planning um, at the time or planning around at the time was the GTA West corridor. And the GTA West corridor is a 400 series highway that is expected to go north south through the middle of the site. Uh, when you really drill down into these principles, it becomes readily apparent that you can't achieve all of the goals of that vision with a highway barreling down through the, the center of the plan. Um, these ideas are really incompatible. Slide. So recognizing that the highway was a constraint to development, we started phase two by trying to develop a transportation network that achieves the mobility goals of a highway, but doesn't sterilize as much land and represents uh, the vision of what the stakeholders wanted to be more accurately. So the third phase was really our opportunity to put pen to paper um, to really make the magic happen, so to speak. Um, it was originally supposed to be held back in March, but as a result of COVID-19, staff had to re-strategize about how to engage. So we actually did a, sh a virtual shred series, which was online um, and transformed what would normally be a four to five day process into a four week process. Um, the four weeks actually gave us a great opportunity to become more intimate with a lot of the issues within the area and every week focused on a different layer of the plan. So week one was really about open space in the environment, understanding which areas needed to be protected um, from an ecological perspective. Week two was about transportation and trying to prioritize active modes as well as transit, in addition to single occupancy vehicles as well as groups movement. Week three was about land uses and finding compatible land uses to achieve that vision but was also an opportunity for us to explore densities and new population and employment targets for the area. Week four was uh, our opportunity to bring all of those layers together to really help tell the story of what we wanted Heritage Heights to be um, in a more comprehensive way. And without giving away the plan right at this moment, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Ian Lockwood, who's gonna describe kind of the thought process that went into the formation of the final plan. Hello, everybody. Chairman, City Council, um, thank you for for uh, having us. Um, yes, week one was the open space layer. We looked at what Mother Nature provided, and we tried to work with it. Um, all these uh, green corridors and 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 water courses and so on. It provided a basic framework for the the whole area. And we looked at neighborhood sizes. We looked at um, how blocks oriented. And um, we started placing the schools and big open spaces and that kind of thing. And so that formed the basic framework of the, the plan. And then week two was about transportation where we superimposed um, streets. And uh, Nan kind of mentioned it, it, it kind of went in a series, but it was a little bit more iterative because we already had a clue on on what direction we wanted to go in terms of land use. So we, we, we kind of revisited things, but basically we're looking at transportation. Uh, creating relationships with the streets, um, creating hierarchy, uh, creating redundancy, creating a, a connected network. And you'll see how um, 
we we decided to to move away from the highway plan because of the destruction that would create through the center of the corridor and a barrier effect and we'll go into more detail on that uh, later and we also talked about um, dealing with speeds um, to advance a lot of the health and vision zero goals of the city. Next slide. So we wanted a place where people could walk. Uh, we wanted a place where people could ride their bikes and access transit. We wanted to make the sustainable choices the easier choices. You can you can still use a car to do everything if you want to, uh, but um, we're going to make it very enticing to follow the open space networks and the trails to get to transit. And so people can be part of the solution easily rather than being uh, cumbersome. Uh, a long time ago, um, people thought that the Earth was in the center of the solar system and all the planets and the sun revolved around the Earth. Um, and the, they tried to model it. And the, the models got very, very complicated and never, never quite got it right until they got the central assumption right. And once the sun was put in the center of the solar system, everything worked out. And so what we're talking about here is priority. Where What's the most important thing? And in city making, um, especially after World War II, we've been putting trucks and cars in the center of our solar system. Everything revolves around those. And what we did at Heritage Heights was we put people in the middle of the solar system and everything revolved around people. Um, not that to mention that you know, cars and so forth aren't important, uh, but the quality of life, health, um, and, and the impacts of the climate were put in, in, this, in the center of the solar system. Next. Leonardo da Vinci drew this, and it was about the scale of, of human beings. And the, the scale of the human informed the design of furniture, houses, uh, buildings, uh, block structure, cities. It was all about the scale of the human being. But more recently, we've been put under pressure to make the scale around highways and, and trucks. And, and we feel that this is an unsustainable model, and we'll go into detail on, on why we think that. Next. We also want to advance the complete streets direction of the city. Um, anybody can accommodate cars, trucks, buses, and you know, the motorists um, using a dendritic hierarchy like is used conventionally. But we wanted to do better than that. We wanted to develop a network that made it easy to walk and bike and, and comfortable for people of all ages and mobility levels. And these are the mobile users. And we also wanted the street network to support the, the institutions, the homes, the businesses, and the recreational areas in a meaningful way of connecting it for all users on, on, on foot, on bike, or by motor vehicle. And those green and those red users are what we call the vulnerable users. And what we're trying to do at Heritage Heights is to make it easy for those folks to succeed. Next. This is a skeleton of a horse. Um, I've never seen a skeleton of a horse myself, but um, you can tell a lot about an animal by its skeleton. The next slide shows the skeleton of a manatee. It's, it's a mammal. Um, in fact, they're both mammals, and they both have lungs, hearts, kidneys. They both eat grass. They both breathe air. But because of their bone structure, they have completely different outcomes. One runs around on the ground. The other one swims leisurely in the water. And cities are much the same. Their bone structure or their street network dictates a lot about how their outcomes will be. And the city on the left is highly walkable. There's great access to the public spaces. It's, it's very legible. If there's a collision somewhere, um, it's probably a, a low speed collision. And there's a lot of redundant routing so that the city can continue functioning successfully. That's a human scale. The city on the right, however, is very car oriented. If there's a collision at that main intersection, the whole thing shuts down. And it's not very resilient to changes in the market. And what we wanted to do in Heritage Height was to make a resilient um, healthy community, more like the one on the left and less like the one on the right. With a parallel network of streets in the cardinal directions, um, we can get smaller streets and carry more car traffic, but also carry uh, pedestrians and cyclists and transit in a more effective way. And it's much easier to walk through a network of smaller streets like you'll find in places like Old Town Alexandria or, or older places. Uh, older or older parts of cities rather than the, the really big suburban uh, streets. And we just saw in a couple of the other presentations earlier this evening, you know, how difficult it is to walk. Next slide. We also looked at block structure and how to create value with our block structures, <laughs> celebrating the open spaces and orienting the blocks properly towards the block structures, block structures and keeping the, the public spaces public by orienting the, 
the most of the streets towards those amenities and, and keeping the edges public. Next. Uh, with designing our parks and schools, uh, we want to keep them to, to feel public and look public and add value to the community. So we'll, we'll most likely design our parks to look like A and not like B, where they're, they're enclosed and, and effectively privatized. Next. And then we, we looked very closely at what we call the A and B streets. And the A streets are the network of streets where they're highly walkable, they're bikeable, they're usually the transit routes. They're the main addresses for, for businesses. And when we apply the land uses to this street network, it makes a very nice um, network of walkable, bikeable, complete streets. And on the B streets, they provide access to parking lots, um, back of house stuff, servicing and so forth. And where there's public spaces, we surround those with A streets um, to, um, to keep them public and make them uh, valuable. And that's an example of a public space with A streets around it. So traditionally value of, of places was a function of proximity. The closer you were to the center, the more valuable. And in modern times, <laughs> the value was assumed to be a function of travel time. And this is the main difference between the 2014 plan, which had a highway going through it, and the 2020 plan, which has a much more sustainable boulevard going through it. The value of the boulevard plan is, is more about proximity. It still accommodates longer trips on the boulevard, but it's not about unsafe speeds and barriers and um, incomplete streets and bad health outcomes like the highway uh, plan of 2014 would create. One of the things we do in transportation is we look at environmental assessments. We look at all sorts of different criteria to, to pick the routes for the corridors and design the corridors. And a lot of that is based on levels of service for motorists and so how fast somebody can drive through a place and not so much about the experience of the place or other factors. So we looked at that for um, the 2014 um, sort of highway idea and then the, the, the more sustainable, healthier um, boulevard plan. And what we're suggesting is level of service be used for things like intersection, signal timing, and so forth. But there's there's better metrics for planning. And here's four of them. Uh, the, on the left side of the equal sign, there's vehicle miles traveled, which is the, the term of art, which also means vehicles, kilometers traveled. And there's an equation here. And what we want is the vehicle miles traveled to go down, but simultaneously you want the number of trips to go up the shopping trips, the work trips, um, the cultural trips, the tourist trips, the recreational trips. Now to make that equation work, we need the modal split to go better. So more walking, cycling and transit use and ideally the average trip length going down as well. Now this is what we can achieve with the 2020 um, plan, which you'll see in a moment. And it's, which is much different than the highway plan, which actually worsens modal splits and creates more automobile dependency and lengthens trip lengths, which increases vehicle miles traveled. Now, this equation is all about creating value, vibrancy, health, and place. And that's what we were trying to do with the 2020 plan. The 2014 plan, which has the highway going through it, does the opposite. It reduces value, stifles vibrancy, and creates and exacerbates the health emergency and then the climate emergency. So the public policy statements up top, um, and then there's lots of ways to achieve those policies on the bottom. Here are the two um, competing visions. Uh, one is the highway-based uh, model, and one is a, a place-based model. And so we're suggesting the, the boulevard model because it creates a human scale, it's comfortable, it's safer, it's accessible, it's engaging, it's, it's urban, and it attracts value, unlike the highway, which repels value, which we'll go into uh, more detail in a moment. This is the plan for the highway uh, going around the north uh, part of the area. And the, in the white square on the left is um, Heritage Heights. And, and Brampton's kind of tucked down uh, to the right of that. There's two interchanges in the plan that we saw, one on Beauvert and one on Mayfield. Um, and the highway corridor goes to the middle. And the, the province has almost um, figured out where the, the, the alignment ought to be if there were a highway built. There's Heritage Heights. and. The trouble with the highway is it is it blocks access and cities are, are about access and highways are about throughput and and the highway also devalues everything in its proximity with a couple hundred meters in each way and creates a, a rather uh, 
undesirable area to develop um, near the highway, but it does add value to places far away and, and, and actually encourages sprawl. And, if, and it, it's sad if you're on the wrong side of the highway, um, the east side of the highway is be more valuable because it's closer to the rest of the city. But if you're on the wrong side of the highway, uh, you have a, a major barrier. The other thing about the highways, it concentrates a lot of traffic on just a couple of streets, Mayfield and Beauvaird. So the quality of life and safety on Beauvaird and Mayfield will drop as it will at the, a lot of the intersections that will be highly impacted by the, the highway traffic going to and from the highway. Next. So the best cities around North America and, and a lot of other places around the world are, are de-emphasizing highways in the cities. Uh, they're removing their highways and uh, doing other things. Next. Our firm is, has been working in that space. Um, we've, we've done several highway removal efforts. This one is in Oakland, uh, California. The highway on the top is the nine, uh, Interstate 980 and the on the bottom is the, the boulevard that we'll hopefully be replacing it with at, because when it went through, um, if you look at the top left, it devalued everything in West Oakland um, and um, created a lot of um, safety problems, health issues, um, and um, economic problems. Next. This is what we would propose or something like it. This is a, a potential boulevard plan. It, it's 104 meters wide as opposed to 170 meters uh, for the highway, so it's much more uh, space efficient. Um, but it also attracts value people and investment. And we'll, we'll go through the um, the um, makeup of the of the boulevard in a moment. This is the edge. One of the beautiful things about multi-lane boulevards is that they're valuable. They create a seam which connects the community. It's the center of the community, uh, and it's it's the opposite from a highway which repels life and um, and value. This, this is where a lot of the shops will be, the homes will be. Um, it will be highly walkable, bikeable, and accessible for people uh, by transit um, and by motor vehicle. So let's go through the anatomy of the boulevard. So on the far left, there's a um, sidewalk and we're sizing it to, to allow for social distancing and retailing along the edge next to the buildings. Next is the separated bike facility, uh, which allows for a two-way bike flow and in both directions um, to provide great access on the busiest street for uh, people on bikes. Next is the, the frontage lanes, which provides um, on-street parking and um, access for anybody for, for shopping and so forth. And the interesting thing about this frontage lane is that there's no vertical curb. So anybody in a wheelchair or with any mobility impairment can get to and from the land uses um, easily. And next is a... Um, a landscape buffer and um, and it's to provide you know, one of several rows of trees and uh, the ability to do a turn into the frontage lane and that whole edge is a comfortable place for all modes uh, very accessible so you got the best of both worlds you got an accessible edge and then you get the throughput um, down the middle of the the boulevard these are the through lanes for the, we call it the main line. And a little innovation in this boulevard, we're proposing um, a, a truck lane each way. And uh, the idea is that for um, any of the goods movement that happens to be in the area, uh, they don't get, unlike the 400 series highways, which bog down during the peak hours, um, and you're going, to, you know, like 10 or 15 kilometers an hour, uh, we'll have a reliable, um, uh, truck facility um, in all in all times of day on the boulevard, and then in the middle we have the the transit system for 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 buses and an LRT if it ever were to come, but it'd be, we anticipated it would be buses. And then what we're proposing in this concept is what we call far side stations, so that um, the stations will be at the intersections, and so you cross halfway, get on the bus, and when you and um, so it's equally distance from each side uh, to get to the bus stations. And on the other side is where, if there would need to be a left turn lane, that's where it would, would go. And then these are the frontage lanes. Um, notice they go the other way. Uh, they go um, 
we call them clockwise frontage roads because you turn right in and right out. And that's very important for, for uh, operations, which you'll see in a moment. So this is a, um, a diagram of one that we implemented already, but you can see that the flow of the frontage lane goes the opposite of the main line. And, and the reason is, is so that um, when you leave, you can actually see where you're going. Um, if it goes the other way, um, you're turning and looking over your left shoulder. This way you're looking out of your driver's window when you turn. The nice thing about this is that the um, because of the flow going the other way, uh, drivers coming into the frontage lane and leaving don't have to crisscross, and so um, you don't get any queuing onto the main line, which is the big disadvantage of conventional uh, boulevards. And then if there is a little backup, it backs up on the frontage lane and the side street and not on the main line. So it keeps the main line flowing efficiently. Next. Oh, and then when you come in, it's easy wayfinding. So if you spot your ice cream store, you can do a U-turn and get in there. You don't have to anticipate the ice cream store uh, ahead of time. And then the uh, pedestrian crossing um, is along the building edge where it's um, less busy and, and much more comfortable. And then uh, the, just the keys, you just got to make sure that um, that green space is big enough so you can have a nice radius to get in and out. So that's the boulevard. So to be very comfortable, very multimodal, and very interestingly, it can be staged um, uh, with development over time. Um, so you don't have to pay for the whole thing up front. It can be built as you need it, uh, and not too big, not too small, just as you need it. So um, if it were to get busier over time, you can add lanes to it, but you don't have to. Um, and then, and then as the boulevard develops, you can add the frontage lanes. The um, the boulevard doesn't need frontage lanes on every block. You can just add them as you need them and fill them in. So it's um, it's stageable, which is a big advantage financially. And should a block want to close its frontage lane for an art festival or a, a sidewalk sale, you can you can do it. And then and it's flexible, so you could um, prevent um, through traffic along the access lane and keep it on the main line. Um, which I'll show you in a, a project that we did in Australia on a boulevard there. If you look at the median just at the bottom on the side street, notice it um, ensures that the frontage lane um, isn't used as a through lane, but it allows pedestrians and cyclists to uh, continue up and down the boulevard comfortably. And then because of the clockwise nature of the frontage lanes, the signals for the intersection operate just like a regular intersection. So you get um, normal cycle lengths and, and, and it keeps the efficiency high. So we looked at the criteria that the province used for the alignment of the highway and we compared how the highway performed compared to the boulevard. And there's a bunch of criteria in different categories, natural environment, socioeconomic factors, transportation, goods movement, and implementation. And from an, the natural environment perspective, I won't go through all of them, the, the boulevard completely outperforms the highway. From a socioeconomic and cultural environment perspective, again, the boulevard completely um, eclipses the highway. Um, you know, from, from space to noise to everything you can imagine, we're, we think of highways as the blockbuster video of transportation infrastructure. Uh, we think it's a, an obsolete model for cities, and the, the smartest cities and the best cities are, are not emphasizing their highways anymore. They're doing boulevards and more urban infrastructure. From a transportation perspective, the, the highway does carry more volume. However, those, those trips are long-distance trips, and often the, um, the number of trips can be higher on the boulevard because they're much shorter. Also, some people think that the higher speeds on the highway is, is better than slower speeds on the boulevard. But you have a climate emergency going on, a health emergency and a vision zero um, idea. And high speeds are the um, largest safety risk um, for, um, for transportation. It is responsible for more deaths and injuries um, than any other factor. So it could be seen as a disadvantage as well, and, and in terms of noise and other purposes. Now, from a goods movement perspective, the, um, the boulevard is better for local goods distribution because it has much superior access. But the, um, the long distance goods movement is probably better on the highway because um, 
especially in, in off-peak hours. In peak hours, the boulevard's better because um, the 400 series highways deliver higher speeds in off-peak hours, but when people actually need the 400 series highways, they tend to bog down, and that bogs down the um, trucks as well, which the, which the modeling is shown. Um, and, and, and so for, um, same with um, just life experience, I think we've all experienced the congestion on the 401. <clears throat> and then from implementation, it's not a contest. The cost is, is for the boulevard is less. It's easier to maintain. It can be staged. Um, it's better on the environment and so forth. So for most criteria, the boulevard outperforms the highway. Next. And then we'd want the other streets as well to be comfortable and walkable. And these are called yield streets. And so a lot of the residential streets can be these, um, what we call yield streets, which can canopy over nicely with trees. And then non-yield streets that are slightly busier, um, it'd be a little bit wider, but the same idea, we we have um, sidewalk sized so that you can socially distance for increased resilience um, and um, yeah, high quality of life on these streets as well. So there's all of these streets, these are the B streets that provide servicing, um, access to parking lots, that kind of thing, <laughs> excuse me. And these are the A streets where, um, these are the important addresses where you'd want to walk to and ride to and access to these buildings would be off of the B streets. And then sometimes some of these A streets are of course next to open spaces and same idea, um, great addresses. And then on a lot of A streets we'll want parking on, on one side or two sides and um, and we can provide that as well. So this is this is the example with it on one side and this is the example with it on two sides. Uh, Ian, it's Peter Fay, the clerk. I just wonder if you can uh, give a sense of how long it'll be to f to re to finish the presentation. I know some members are asking. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go as fast as I can. Um, I don't really know though, because it's been a while since um, we ran through it. Okay. So Thanks. basically, um, those are the streets. This is the land use. Um, so it, it what we're trying to do is respect what we call the transect or the context and um, have what we call like facing like. Next slide. Uh, this, um, I just, those slides just show a large iteration of plans, which ended up at, at this transportation network plan. Next. One of the issues with the site is that we have environmental constraints to the east and the south. So getting north-south um, connectivity is really difficult. So we, we went out of our way to create a north-south uh, network of streets, which are shown in yellow there. And then we um, did the same to connect to the, the bigger streets east-west. And then we added in the um, the rest of the network. And of course, the heavy lifting would be done by the boulevard down the center. So we got a very effective north, south, east, west street network, which lends itself to complete streets, walking and, and cycling. These are the crossings over the um, rail uh, to connect the north and the south. So this is the kind of atmosphere, the desired image and value. Uh, that's a conventional street on the left and what we're proposing is on the right with the trees and the correct spaces and um, the right scale. And, and that applies all the way up to the largest street in the whole place, which of course is the boulevard. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna pass the baton on to Andrea and she's gonna talk about the land use. And I'll be brief as I go through the considerations we um, entertained as we went through the land use planning process. Um, as we evaluated the site, it became clear that the potential for a GO station was a real advantage for Heritage Heights. Next slide. That's what you see in the middle um, with the red line. So um, in the purple, you see what we envision to be a medical district. This could be um, a variety of healthcare or medical related uses. Next slide as well as a main street. This is something that surrounds a public gathering square that could be used for festivals or other events with retail um, restaurants on the street and services. And the red you see high density residential and mixed use commercial retail and office. That of course surrounds the boulevard. Beyond that, uh, we get to medium density residential. And then even beyond that, we um, get to low density residential. 
And then on the left side of your screen, which is the north side of the site, we envision some um, light industrial uses, which could accommodate a variety of employment opportunities, and then some uh, convenience commercial, which is in purple. You can also see convenience and commercial along the east side of the site. Uh, parks and schools are planned throughout the neighborhoods. These are details that we still plan to work out as we move forward, but those are considerations that we made. And then, of course, the baseline of the um, open space and environmental systems going through the site. Uh, you see circles along um, the boulevard. Those circles are centered upon transit facilities. The middle one is the GO station, and then the one on the left and the right, or the north and the south, are uh, transit transfer facilities. So those could be for bus or light rail or BRT. In the future, the smaller circle indicates a five-minute walk. The larger circle indicates a 10-minute walk. And the red lines show how far you can get on bicycle within about five minutes, um, which is to say most of Heritage Heights. When we were evaluating the um, employment and population potential of the site, we created a low and a high uh, range. This was for planning purposes. You can see those numbers here. And then we evaluated it based on um, different portions of the site. So in that 10-minute uh, walk from the major transit station areas, we also created a range for population, dwelling units, and employment. And then we evaluated it as well for the areas outside those major transit station areas. The land use categories range from um, high density residential and mixed use, medium density residential, low density residential, wellness district, main street, light industrial and convenience commercial. Those are described here. The high density residential with mixed use ranges from 125 to 250 dwelling units per acre. These images just show the kind of um, density that might attract. In the uh, medium density residential, it's 50 to 100 dwelling units per hectare. Um, this is mainly multifamily, sort of a mid rise, but could vary from low rise to high rise depending upon the urban structure. Low density residential ranges from um, single or multifamily detached or attached housing, low rise uh, apartment buildings, 20 to 50 units per hectare. And then finally, the main street is a place for the community to gather. This is um, intended to be an authentic place with ground floor retail, residential, um, I'm sorry, restaurant, uh, service uses, open spaces, places for people to gather and um, exchange ideas, be social, enjoy the neighborhood. So this bit is about proximity. So we wanted everything within a convenient walk. Um, so let's look at public schools. So we placed the public schools all this site, and if you look at um, the public schools in conjunction with the separated bike lanes, you'll see that every single public school is accessible by bike and by foot. Um, so there's the X-ray of the public schools with the um, the bike facilities, and you can see in the next slide that um, it's a short walk to every every school. We have great coverage. Similarly, that we have parks uh, throughout the area so that everybody can find a park within a, in a, within a very close walk of their house. And next slide. Um, and now there's a few exceptions um, to the rules. Uh, we have a, just keep clicking through, um, you know, so there's the, we put the Catholic schools on the edges because they bust most of the people, but they want to be interior. There's a couple employment areas to the very north and south and some convenience density along the, um, the transit route along um, Mississauga Road. So there's a couple of exceptions, but most of this, um, including those convenience retail on the corners, but the vast majority of this is completely transit um, friendly and, and highly walkable uh, down trails and so forth to get the, to the trains and the bus stations. Next. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think there may be a technical problem. Next slide. OK, 
Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we can, Ian. Andrew, is, is there a problem with the slides? No, nope. uh, is, is this the slide you want? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. So the question is, what do we do with the, there's about a thousand developable hectares. Next slide. And you can see the red line is the, the boundary for uh, Brampton. Next slide. I want to just talk about planner rec pattern recognition for a second, because there's a lot of um, myths floating around about the, particularly the trucking. Um, but just, um, I know the folks making the decisions probably aren't trucking experts, but you, you can see from these few pictures that, that that dancer has a nice line, there's a pretty flower and so forth. Next slide. You don't have to be an, um, an expert on things to, to see that this set of tiles is 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 not particularly legible. Um, you can do a statistical analysis on these tiles, but it's it's actually better to take the same photograph with by blurring your lens. The detail can sometimes um, obscure the actual message. And what this is is a picture of um, Sir John A. Macdonald, who just happens to look a lot like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> just just kidding. Uh, but the idea is to use pattern recognition about the relationships rather than worry about the detail. You don't have to be an expert on driveways to see there's a problem here. The fact that the aggregate's large doesn't matter. You don't have to be an expert on utilities to see this poles in the wrong place. Next. One, you don't have to be an architect to figure out that one of these houses doesn't fit in on the street. Next. But what I'd like to talk about is value. And you have 2,500 acres to work with and you wanna get as much value out of that as possible. And here's a map of a city and the taller the little spike lines are, the, that's the value per acre. And we're gonna take a look at that. And this pattern is, is per, um, in just every city. And how do you compare things? Um, if, you were, if you were assessing vehicles based on miles per tank, you pick the pickup truck. Next, that's the best vehicle. The little BMW is not very good, but if you look at it miles per gallon, then you'd pick the little uh, BMW in the middle. So depending what you measure, you make different decisions. Next. So if you were measuring by transaction, you would pick the Walmart because you get $20,000 or sorry, $20 million in taxes compared to 11,000 for the little downtown. But it takes 34 acres as opposed to 0.2 of an acre. And if you look at the other metrics, um, taxes per acre, city sales tax per acre, residents and, and um, employees, the, the urban, building completely outperforms the land consumptive Walmart. Next. So what do we do with our little um, two and a half thousand acres? Do you want to build the value you get at A or B? And clearly you want to do A, or sorry, B. You want to do B, you want higher value, <laughs> sorry. And I just want to show you some, just quickly just run through these. Just, it doesn't matter what city you go to, you'll see the same patterns, Albuquerque, Manchester, uh, Bozeman, Montana. Um, Oh, and then let's go to Canada. Um, there's Guelph, same pattern, doesn't matter where you are. The urban areas are more valuable than the suburban areas. Let's take a look at Eugene. And this is a cross section through Eugene. On the top are the values you get. This is the tax money you get. And the, the bottom in red is the costs. So do you want Heritage Heights to be A, where you, you get a little bit of tax value and lots of expenses, or B, where you get much more um, revenue uh, which actually pays and covers the the the, um, the services. So with A, that's the 2014 plan. B is the 2020 plan. Which which infrastructure do you want? Do you want a big highway or do you want a boulevard? And um, I just want to point out that when the boulevard in Paris was built, it was built out into rural land, just like we're talking about here in Brampton. But what they had was vision. And they built the boulevard and they got urban outcomes as a result, unlike the big highways. Next. Uh, less space is required for the boulevard than the highway. And it results in way more value in image, land use patterns, maintenance costs, property value. Everything is more valuable about the uh, boulevard. And the proof of the pudding is in real cities. Um, this is uh, in Milwaukee. And if there's the highway going through, and if it added value, that's the highest and best use around it. But they took the highway out, and lo and behold, the place got more valuable. More jobs came in, more housing came in, the land values went up. Next. This is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we did a project to remove this highway, 
um, the Texas, or sorry, the uh, Tennessee DOT said um, that the highway was absolutely needed for jobs and all that sort of thing, all the usual rhetoric we hear, but we replace it with this um, our urban friendly street and lo and behold, more jobs, more value, uh, more residents, more everything came to Chattanooga once the highway was out uh, compared to when it was in. Next. Uh, San Francisco, Caltrans said that they needed the Embarcadero freeway for jobs, for goods movement, for all the usual things that you hear from the highway lobby. It fell down because of a earthquake and they did not rebuild it. Now there's more trips than there ever was when there was a highway, but they're not 120,000 long distance car trips. They're walking trips, bike trips, transit trips. The place is far more valuable, far more jobs, far more tourism, and a far better city and a far better image. And this is not just limited to North American cities. You can go around the world. This is in Seoul, Korea. They built this highway on top of a river and then they decided to take it out. And now it's the second largest tourist attraction in all of Korea. And again, added a lot more value to the city. Same thing in Trenton. It works both ways. When you put highways in, the values go down as well. So they have this beautiful Olmsted uh, park. They built the highway through it. And what happened to uh, Trenton is it devalued. That's what happens when you build highways through places. It devalued the neighborhoods. So we did a plan to remove the highway and the, the values will come back. So the question is, what do you want? What's your vision? Um, you have the 2014 plan on the bottom and the 2020 plan on top. You get more than double the population, houses and jobs for the same amount of infrastructure. So if you want your money to go further, <coughs> go with the 2020 plan. If you go with the 2014 plan, you'll get ha less than half the revenue for the same amount of costs. It's about 40 something percent. Um, uh, is is what you get out of the uh, the 20, 2014 plan. Next, okay. I, I think in, uh, we're 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 getting the the signal that we need to wrap up. Uh, so I, I think we better stop there and uh, and ask if there are any questions that that we need clarification on. Okay. Thank you very much. I do know we have a list of obligations, but I do see Councilor Fortini uh, has uh, asked to. Uh, ask a question before we move on to delegations. Usually the practice is we wait for all the delegations, but I think just uh, in the sake of not losing a train of thought and ensuring that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a more fulsome Q&A. Councillor Fortini. Well, mine was more uh, thanking the staff. You know, this is way overdue and I do agree with them with the, uh, the boulevard. You look at other parts of the world and uh, it's a lot better. So I want to thank staff for all the hard work. I know this is long overdue and these residents and everyone in the heritage section has been waiting for many years. So, uh, you know, as moving forward, you know, I know we have to do a little bit of tweaking, you know, on uh, high density, low density, commercial, industrial. But uh, so far, I wonder, we just want to thank staff for all the hard work they did. And, and this way, it gives a little bit of peace of mind that uh, the people in the heritage sites could start moving forward. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Fertini, uh, you managed to slip that one past me, so I'll let that go. <laughs> and I'll hand it over to you to City Clerk to uh, initiate our delegations, as I don't see any further questions by uh, any members of the committee, uh, and I think they're respectfully waiting for after the delegations. Over to you, City Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there are eight delegations in total. Uh, the first will be Sonny Ray, followed by Sylvia Roberts and David Lang. And just to allow, uh, bring to committee's attention, there are 10 pieces of correspondence in regard to this item, including three pieces, uh, two from uh, Ganya Walker Domes, uh, and one in association with uh, Glenn Schnarr Associates, and the other from David Fay in regards to tonight's item. So, uh, Sonny, uh, if you want to proceed, you can turn your microphone on and you have five minutes. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you, committee chair, committee members, planning staff, and consultants. Um, Brampton planning staff have developed a vision for one of the last large vestiges of undeveloped lands remaining in the city. Heritage Heights, located at the northwest of the city, is envisioned as a vibrant, pedestrian-focused, mixed-use neighborhood connected to a new GO station stop along the Kitchener GO line. Unfortunately, this vision is counter to the province's proposed GTA West Highway a six lane 400 series highway currently being planned to the heart of the same neighborhood. In order to make their vision for Heritage Heights a reality, Brampton needs to convince the province that their proposed highway needs to be compromised. Uh, planning staff have, have proposed a 104 meter wide boulevard complete with lanes upon lanes of roadway, at once a compromised highway and a compromised urban vision. A 104 meter wide expanse of traffic is not an urban vision that any city should promote. It will not be a great place for pedestrians, 
are cyclists, nor will it be a vibrant, nor will it create vibrant commercial streets. It will take an able-bodied person a minute to cross the street of this wood. To give an example of the scale of this expanse, University Avenue in Toronto is just under 30 meters wide, curb to curb. Ramtip would like you to believe a road over the three times this width has an urban future. The highway cuts through this part of Brampton because neighboring Halton Hills decided their future didn't include this highway. Halton Hills, and more specifically MVP Ted, Ted Arnott, pushed back against the GTA West Highway when it was planned to continue westward. The highway tied up 75 acres of employment lands. The land was more valuable to Halton Hills without the highway, not because of it. Brampton was dealt with a compromised route in return. Without a highway or boulevard, Brampton will, will be able to open up more lands for development, creating more housing and jobs connected to higher order transit. This is precisely the type of development the province has been supportive of elsewhere. Transit focused urban development, creating more riders for existing public transit while reducing car dependency. In fact, Brampton will need to show the province that future ridership numbers warrant this station. Brampton shouldn't be compromising its future. It should its instead expose the province's proposed highway for what it is, an outdated, ineffective way to build cities, create jobs, and reduce traffic congestion. It does neither of these well. I encourage the city to study what a real vision for these lands and your entire city looks like without a highway, a vision that doesn't compromise Brampton's future. Thank you. Thank you. The next delegation is Sylvia Roberts and uh, Sylvia, we're just, I believe you have a few slides. We're just bringing them up on the screen now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay, so um, Ian Lockwood was showing Joe Minacuzzi's slide. Here's another one. This is for Lafayette County. While he did mention that in terms of infrastructure, it's a lot less, what needs to be considered is it's not just hard services like roads and water mains. And for those, he is entirely correct. It's not much more different in terms of cost for infrastructure, whether it's 60,000 or 130,000. There's other services that need to be considered. In most corporations, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit corporation, the board of directors has a fiduciary duty to the corporation. For Brampton, you're looking at a billion dollars in infrastructure at minimum for this. And you have no information on the value of what's going to be produced. So it's it's a bit crazy to just to continue to go ahead without considering like the uh, value to cost for the items. I'm not saying don't do it. You can work on this. Whether you the value for the city overall needs to be looked at. Uh, next slide. So the city of Brampton has a bit of a geometry issue. You really only have three east-west roads, which are Steeles, Queen, and Beauvaird slash Castlemore. Uh, Williams Parkway has issues because it's not wide enough to function as a full arterial road like that. Beauvaird is the last one to the north end because the house Sandalwood curves and Wanless and Countryside are broken up. In contrast, you have many north and south roads because of the concession road system. So you, for the east-west, you have to build BRTs. With the population plan for Heritage Heights, there's going to be a very large amount of traffic going in and out. And with Heritage Heights, Brampton basically bumps up against Georgetown. To make this work, you need to have a BRT on Beauvaird. And because the traffic can't be handled otherwise, in the consultant report, it talks about Cornell and Markham. One of the reasons why Cornell as a transit-oriented development didn't work is the transit arrived after people were moving in. So in order to get to the services, there was no transit, and it was too far from stuff. So they had cars, and they drove, and they continued driving. So you have random parts of Brampton that are general suburbia that have higher transit ridership than Cornell simply because we have better transit service there and those people had to all go out and buy cars. <laughs> Next slide. So this is a 
so to the north, so we have the outline of the city of Brampton. North of that, that's the white belt portion of Cal, a rough sketch of the white belt portion of Caledon. That's the area they can build out. And to the west is the area of Halton Hill. So Georgetown is to the uh, center of that. And then south is a large greenfield area they have it done. So the potential amount of population being added there is significant because it's in the corner of the city. You need to consider not just the Brampton population, but also the surrounding municipalities. The north of Brampton only has one large employment area, and that is the Heart Lake uh, Snell Grove employment area. To prevent huge congestion from Caledon, because they just got an MZO to continue to build even more houses, and Georgetown is also looking at expanding. You're probably going to need to look at redeveloping that area, not for housing, but to elevate it. That area is over two and a half square kilometers. So to accommodate the population there, you're going to need to increase the jobs density. You can't have people switched away from cars if they need to go 15 kilometers for a job. Uh, that's my delegation. Thank you. Thank you. And the next delegation is David Lang. Go ahead, David. Yes. Um, uh, good evening, um, Mr. Chair, members of, uh, of committee, um, staff, and members of the public. My name is David Lang. I'm a 40-year-plus uh, Brampton resident and an advocate for Brampton to pursue a path towards one planet living. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the staff report, Conceptual Land Use Plan, Heritage Heights Secondary Plan. I participated in the Heritage Sites Heights Visioning uh, Charette that took place in November 2019. And I also participated in the 2040 visioning sessions that were held in 2017-2018. I am an informed citizen and I am confident that I reflect the views of many of my fellow residents who believe that a vibrant city can only be built when economic prosperity is balanced by, by environmental sustainability, social stability, with a focus on happiness and quality of life for the residents who live in the city day in and day out. On June 24, 2020, Mayor Brown sent a letter to the federal government's Department of Infrastructure and Communities. And the letter states in part, and I quote, the city of Brampton's 2040 vision, living the mosaic is about the environment, jobs and urban centers, neighborhoods, mobility, social matters, health, along with the arts and culture. In the matter of transportation, Brampton's 2040 vision states that the city will be a mosaic of safe, integrated transportation choices and new modes contributing to a civic sustainability and emphasizing walking, cycling, and transit." Un unquote. If the 413 is built as a standard limited access highway, think about it, it'll have a 40 to 60 year engineering lifespan, yet it is a pretty safe bet that its useful life as a commuter highway will be much shorter. We have less than a decade to address the climate crisis. In Brampton, transportation accounts for 60% of our carbon emissions. Sooner rather than later, we need to face the simple truth that at least for urban centers like Brampton, Mississauga, and Toronto, the personal automobile is simply too expensive financially, environmentally, and socially to continue as the primary transportation option. In fact, transportation tr habits are already changing. And as an illustration, I have a friend who lives in Brampton with four children ages, ages 16 to 23. None of the four have a driver's license. Now that's anecdotal for sure, but supported by research that indicates that the younger generation is already moving away from the car, a pattern that is likely to accelerate because of COVID-19. Today, most daily trips taken in the city of Brampton are walkable or bikeable. We just need to normalize cycling and walking as a legitimate form of transportation. We need to build more compact communities, as is being proposed. We need more infrastructure that is safe and comfortable for our vulnerable road users. We don't need another fenced off, high speed, multi lane behemoth running through yet another divided community. We have enough of those in Brampton already. Thank you very much. What we do need in Heritage Heights is a roadway that provides a useful purpose while offering a sense of place that exudes environmental and social sustainability. Hooray for the consultants that have put this together. And we don't need to be dictated to by the province. Communities can say no. If that weren't the case, then the Allen slash Spadina Expressway would long ago have connected the 401 to the Gardner. And besides, 
The boulevard option aligns with provincial government priorities, including more effective land use for economic development with a focus on mixed use affordable housing stock. And finally, to those who are just now putting forward their own concept for a quote unquote better plan, I say, where were you last November and, and during the uh, charrettes that took place? The staff re this staff report does an excellent job of capturing the needs and priorities articulated during the stakeholder charrettes. This is the vision that most stakeholders and concerned citizens want to see implemented for the Heritage Heights community. Vision 2040 is a bold and innovative set of ideas and concepts that reflect the way that Brampton residents want our city to become as we grow. For a vision to succeed, however, words must be translated to actions. Decisions must be made today, tomorrow, and next year that will move us closer to what we ultimately want. And sometimes, good decisions that move us toward our long-term aspirations may appear nonsensical if viewed in the context of today's realities. Um, councillors uh, and, and committees, I would, I would say, suggest to you that your job as leaders is to make the tough decisions that are in the best long-term interests of our whole community. So I urge you to support the Boulevard option as recommended by staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next delegation is Alexander Adams. Alexander, please proceed. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, hi, Brampton Council. My name is Alex Adams. This is my deputation debut. I'm a lifelong Brampton resident. I'm future majority's com Brampton community lead, and I'm starting Masters of Planning at Ryerson in September. Today, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about two parallel experiences. The first is written by a friend who was unable to give his deputation, so I'm gonna read it out for them. Quote, Brampton Council, I reviewed the reports, the GTA West Highway 413 EA material and read media articles on the GTA West Highway 413. I grew up in Bramley, near Bramley Road and Williams Parkway. I attended North Park Secondary School, which is located near the northeast corner of the 400 Series Highway 410 in Williams Parkway. Here are some statistics for your reflection that describe my five years at North Park in the late 1990s to early 2000s. The number of times I walked to North Park along Williams Parkway westbound over the 410 zero. The number, t number of times I cycled over the 410 after school, zero. The number of times I skateboarded over the 410, zero. The number of times I rollerbladed over the 410, zero. The number of times I crossed the 410 after school to purchase something at a retail store, zero. The number of times I crossed the 410 after school to work at a part-time job, zero. The number of times after school I crossed the 410 to volunteer, Zero. The number of times after school I crossed the 410 to attend any form of after school program, internship, or skilled trade. Zero. The number of times I walked with a grandparent over the 410. Zero. The number of times I walked with a kid I was babysitting over the 410. Zero. The number of times I remember any of my friends doing any of the above. Zero. The number of cars I remember my friends owning. Zero. Brampton Council, the current students of North Park Secondary School and all students across Brampton right now have an approved number by you. It is 2040. When I was a student in Brampton in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s, what was the number my classmates and me were most familiar with? Zero. End quote. What my friend so eloquently identified is an invisible barrier. Fast forward 20 years, my experiences aren't all that different. I live a bit further west at Williams Parkway in Howden. I went to Aquinas for high school, but that invisible barrier remained the same for me and every other person along the 410 corridor. Yes, in 2018, a former gravel quarry bridge over the 410 became a pedestrian only bridge. However, that was a lucky break for the city and for decades it wasn't available. What this bridge did do was make Brampton west of the 410 accessible to me. And I discovered so many reasons to love the city beautiful trails along the Etobicoke Creek, an old pit converted into stunning lakes, which since this lockdown started, I have walked around it daily. I finally get to enjoy the investments the city has made to make Brampton one of the most beautiful and livable suburbs in Canada. But I am one of the lucky ones. This bridge is the only one of its kind in Brampton. There remains an invisible barrier to the investments that council makes in Brampton 
for every pedestrian who doesn't live nearby that bridge, which was only made accessible in 2018. Now, the GTA West Highway 413 in Brampton will just create another invisible barrier. Those pedestrians in Heritage Heights will not be able to enjoy the Brampton I know and love. It would be extremely costly to install a lot of pedestrian bridges over the GTA West Highway 413 when a better option exists on Boulevard. The question before you in the province is this. Are you going to build artificial barriers or will you create true connections to leverage your investment? Thank you. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. The next uh, delegation is a video delegation from um, James Reed, and we will cue that up momentarily. Good evening, Mr. Chair, committee members, staff, and the public. My name is James Reed, and I'm a lifelong resident of Heritage Road, born and raised, and continue to do so with my wife and three small children. Some of you know my father, Bruce. He and my mom have been on the home farm for the last 48 years. First off, I'd like to sincerely thank city staff. There's been a lot of personnel on the Northwest Brampton file over the years uh, since the lands were brought into the urban boundary. Uh, Andrew and Anan deserve a ton of credit uh, for pulling this together the way they did. Uh, in addition, they were the ones uh, to bring on Ian Lockwood, who, in my opinion, has taken this plan to a whole nother level. There's been a lot of history with Northwest Brampton, uh, for whatever those reasons may be. Um, uh, the area has always been put on the back burner year after year. Uh, we've always allowed, we've always been allowing other jurisdictions to dictate what happens to Brampton's last Greenfield area. Uh, you folks are the third term of council now to lay claim to the planning process for Heritage Heights. Um, and for a municipality and council that's declared both a health care emergency and a climate change emergency, uh, now is the time to think outside the box and challenge the status quo. Uh, this plan is a whole new way of thinking. Um, it would be easy for us as a municipality just to an accept, accept the, uh, the 400 series highway, uh, cut it right through our, our community in Heritage Heights and, and build the same old communities of the past. Um, but uh, I believe we need to look, look to the future and, uh, and truly build a livable, walkable, fun place to live in, in Brampton. Um, is the plan perfect? No. Uh, will we have 100% buy-in from everyone? I, I probably not. Uh, but what we do have is is what I believe is a collective team effort between uh, the city and and a lot of the landowners in the area um, uh, to to actually build uh, this plan that every Bramptonian can be proud of. Um, Will the plan adapt and mold as, as we learn new information as it comes in? Absolutely, it, it, it has to. Um, uh, staff have taken months and months of workshops, design charrettes, um, meetings, and now into Zoom calls uh, to produce the plan that's before you this evening. Uh, I strongly urge the, the, the planning committee this evening to uh, endorse the staff reports. Uh, so again, that collective team can can once again roll up their sleeves and, and start lobbying these different jurisdictions that we need to to make this plan a reality. So um, unlike a lot of the landowners in the area that have no ties or roots to Brampton, my family's been here for half a century. Uh, we want to be, my family wants to be proud of of what is to be Heritage Heights. And, and I certainly believe the plan that's before you tonight uh, points us in the right direction. So uh, uh, in closing, once again, uh, kudos to city staff. Uh, they've done a great job and uh, I'm truly excited uh, of where we're headed with Heritage Heights. Uh, and I thank you for the time. Thank you. Our next delegation is from Keith Brooks. 
Uh, Keith, please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'll try to keep my remarks short as I uh, I know it's, it's getting late. Uh, I'm the Programs Director for Environmental Defense Canada. We're a Canadian environmental charity uh, focused, uh, where we're located in Toronto, we're focused on, on fighting climate change, on protecting fresh water, on solving the plastic pollution crisis, and then promoting sound land use planning protecting green space and, and promoting and agriculture uh, while also allowing for smart growth. And I just want to start to say that we're very supportive of the recommendations in the staff report and we urge the council to adopt them. Uh, in particular, we believe that Brampton will be much better served by an urban boulevard in, in place of the uh, proposed GTA West Highway. And we agree with staff that this plan would create a livable, vibrant and connected community that maximizes employment and housing options and, and more respect the natural context of the community that Brampton is, is seeking. Uh, we also are very supportive and, and fully agree with the principle that led the design charrettes, according to the staff report, the notion of complete communities and a 20 minute neighborhood. We have been advocating for this type of approach to land use planning and development for some time and are uh, very glad to see that the city of Brampton shares the vision. Walkable neighborhoods promote more active transportation, more walking, more cycling, which is healthier for the residents living there and, and better for the environment. Walkable communities attract shops and businesses. They attract residents as well who want to be able to walk through those shops and restaurants and they, and they want to be able to access public transit. And these communities are especially attractive to younger residents, many of whom aren't buying cars as previous generations did. Uh, we also are of the opinion that this development is the only viable path forward for the entire GTHA region, for the entire Greater Toronto Hamilton area and we applaud uh, Brampton staff, council and residents for the vision displayed in this proposal as an alternative to the GTA West Highway plan. The GTHA has a congestion problem. Uh, congestion is a major contributor to climate change. In fact, almost half of the carbon emissions from this region are from cars and trucks. Vehicle pollution is also a major public health hazard. We recently completed the study with, the Toronto, with Toronto Public Health with the University of Toronto and which concluded that cleaner vehicles would save hundreds of billions of dollars each year and save hundreds of lives each year. We would urge uh, staff and council to take a look at our report and, and, and the maps. You can see them on clearingtheair.ca and it shows that the Brampton area and especially near the Pearson Airport is a pollution hotspot. Adding a new highway will make that worse. Promoting a walkable community on the other hand will be much better. And then there's the matter, which I, I think some other delegates might speak to later, that more highways do not lead to less congestion for anyone. Uh, they lead to more urban sprawl, more cars, more pollution. Ch congestion already costs the economy billions of dollars in lost productivity. And the only way to solve this is to move away from more car dependent development and to promote walkable, complete communities as recommended in the staff report and the consultants report. Um, I'm, I'm going to conclude here just to say that environmental defense opposes the construction of the GTA West Highway as it would fail to re reduce travel times and would have a significant community and environmental impacts as indicated in, in the report that, you know, given by the consultants and by council tonight and as you've heard from other deputants. Uh, and we would promote, um, you know, a, a more sustainable vision. Uh, there's a good reason why the environmental assessment for the GTA West was shelved some years ago. The expert panel found that the GTA West Highway, uh, the costs, the, the damage caused by that highway are far, far exceed the, any benefit that might be derived by it. So thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this evening. Environmental Defense and myself personally, uh, Keith Brooks, uh, put ourselves at the disposal of the committee and of council. If we can be of assistance in any way to provide more information about why we support the boulevard over the highway, we're, we're happy to help. Thank you. Our next delegation is from Chris Drew. Chris, please proceed. You have five minutes. Hi, Peter. You can hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, wonderful. I just want to mention, I know on the agenda it says Chris Drew resident. I'm not actually a resident of Brampton, but I am speaking on behalf of my parents and my brother who um, are Brampton residents um, in Councillor Fortini and uh, Councillor Williams wards. So I've also got a friend uh, who lives in Ward 6 in the Heritage Heights study area on a farm. So thank you to Peter actually who informed me this afternoon of an update. So I've cut my deputation uh, and then I further cut it during um, the other deputations. I know it's been a long night, so thanks for your attention. Thanks to all who put together the reports and the decks, the contents, Council's decision, and the province's decision will impact the entire city. The recommendations and analysis done, done are amongst the most significant pieces of information before Council and the public in Brampton's land use planning and transportation history. These reports should reach a big audience to ensure the rationale for the recommendations are understood. What you decide to do and advocate to the province for will change Brampton's future for the next 100 years. The Heritage Heights GTA West 413 highway decision is as significant as other big decisions you and the province will make, with other examples being LRT for Main Street, BRT for Queen Street, and implementing Vision 2040. Since many of you are parents, you know this decision and advocacy isn't just about current residents, it's also about future residents. I was very excited to hear this afternoon from Peter that the city will be moving to the e-scribe system. This system will improve the public accessibility of city staff reports, so it's wonderful to hear it's about to go live. I do hope as soon as possible the staff report and presentation can be uploaded to the city's website. If you Google Heritage Heights Brampton, the first link is to the city's webpage for the study area. Unfortunately, the staff report and consultants reports are not posted there yet. And I do understand from staff that resources weren't available to do this, partly because of COVID-19. And obviously I know how staff have been working extremely hard during COVID-19, but this is really critical public information that should be distributed. Um, and the eScribe system is of course urgently needed. You know, the other reason it's needed is because of the rise of fake news. And for example, Mayor Brown recently called out a Facebook post containing fake news about Brampton, which included a claim that there's a Brampton instead of Peel Police Service. So in your agenda package, I provide a Spacing Magazine article by Dr. Pamela Robinson, who's the director of Ryerson's, Ryerson University's School of Urban and Regional Planning. Her article highlights the benefits of a system the city of Brampton is about to have, which is the East Scribe system. I just wanna end on a, one final note, on a Friday call with staff, the timing of the GTA West was mentioned as being uncertain and that it could take decades and that there's no funding for it. Yet the night before, the Premier and two PC MPPs had a telephone town hall and the GTA West Highway 413 was one of the topics discussed. I assume the city's government relations staff were on the call to provide you and staff with a summary. I'm pointing this out to highlight that the GTA West Highway 413 matter is a real-time situation which has the attention of the province. The staff report, the DEC, the consultants report, and your decision tonight and your level of advocacy, advocacy could not be more timely. This is an important public policy topic. The ultimate final Heritage Heights GTA West Highway 413 decision is a once-in-a-lifetime direction and is irreversible. Thanks so much. Thank you. The, the final delegation is from Peter Miasik from Transport Action Ontario. Go ahead, Peter. You have five minutes. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Miasik. I'm the president of Transport Action Ontario, which is a long-standing province-wide non-government organization advocating for public transportation. Before I go any, go any further, I just want to thank staff for squeezing me in at the last minute, it's the first time I've deputed in Brampton. Uh, like the other speakers tonight, I'm here to urge you to approve the recommendation in the staff report. I had a uh, detailed talk prepared, but I really don't think I need to give it now to parent what staff and Mr. Locke would have said. I just want to remind you that fundamentally, this is a question of whether a six lane expressway should traverse these lands. And the expressway, in case you've forgotten, was stopped by the Wynn government in 2018 based on an excellent advisory panel report that touched upon many of the same negatives that you heard tonight. I believe the expressway can be stopped again because those negatives have not gone away. 
we heard about uh, the uh, negative impacts of expressways, the natural area damage, the greenhouse gases, the air pollutants, the encouragement of auto dependent sprawl. Mr. Lockwood only talked briefly about the financial impact, but they are uh, staggering. This expressway in total will cost $6 billion in capital funding. There's a tremendous number of good local transit projects currently unfunded in this region, like improvements to the GO service or LRTs on Main and Queen that the money could go to. Or of course, it could fund a university or a hospital. Um, so our group certainly applauds Brampton staff recommendation to find an alternative to Urban Boulevard. As Mr. Lockwood pointed out, all over the world, existing expressways are being demolished and converted to such uh, infrastructure. Planning for a boulevard on a corridor that hasn't even been built yet is easy compared to a demo. The staff report is excellent and discusses the benefits, which I don't want to repeat. They did a good job there. Uh, certainly, the conceptual plan still has some uncertainties to it. Uh, there may be potential to reduce the width of the boulevard. Uh, to something closer to what's seen in other cities. And certainly I wasn't able to find any discussion on where the electrical transmission line that are also part of this corridor would go. Nevertheless, the conceptual plan is an excellent start and we urge committee to approve the recommendations in the staff report. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes all the delegations registered for this item. Thank you very much. Um, now, members of committee, uh, you have the opportunity to ask any questions or comments, and I'm looking towards uh, the chat board. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, do, uh, and I am seeing none. Uh, so as a result, um, hello, sorry, was that someone wanted to ask a question? No. no. Okay. Just been background noise. Sorry. Okay. So I guess there's no further questions. I do have a motion moved by Councillor Pelleschi to approve the report recommendations and receive the delegations and correspondence uh, that the staff report and presentation regarding conceptual land use plan, Heritage Heights Secondary Plan, Ward 6 to the Planning Development Committee meeting of July 27, 2020 be received. That Council endorse the Heritage Heights concept plan and direct staff to continue to engage relevant stakeholders, adjacent municipalities, other levels of government and the public to continue to refine the plan and advance the policy framework that will implement the principles of the concept plan as part of the Heritage Heights Secondary Plan. That council direct staff to work with the mayor and members of council to engage the province to seek provincial support for the Heritage Heights concept plan and make adjustments to the GTA West corridor and transmission corridor planning as appropriate through the Heritage Heights community and that the delegation's correspondence in regard to this item be received. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will be count will be counted in the affirmative. Chairman, Chairman I requested. Yeah, I think Councilor Pleshi is saying the same thing. Recorded vote, please. Okay, recorded vote has been requested. City Clerk. Members of committee, uh, recorded vote has been requested. Bear with me while I get out my piece of paper. Um, all those in favor, please indicate. Uh, Councillor Santos is not present in the meeting right now. Uh, Councillor Vasante? Yes, let's end the sprawl. Councillor Willens? Yes. yes. Councillor Pileschi? Absolutely. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Chair Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini, I'll come back to you. Councillor Singh? Absolutely, yes. Councillor Dillon is absent. Councillor Fortini? Mr. Chair, there may have been a technical issue because I don't see Councillor Fortini on the call at the moment, um, but we'll try to verify that. So uh, otherwise, the motion carries uh, seven uh, in favor unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, City Clerk. Uh, we now go on to our next item, which is the added delegations re uh, regarding Habitat for Humanity. 
Uh, and I'll hold it over. I'll send it over to you, City Clerk. Through, through you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, Councilor Vicente here. Um, I didn't realize earlier in the evening when I declared a conflict on item 9.1 that I also need to declare a conflict on these two delegations. Thank you. Through you, okay. Mr. Chair. So, Councillor Visante will be uh, leaving this portion of the meeting uh, in regard to added delegations 5.5 and the added staff report 9.1. Uh, there are two delegations, uh, one from Bruce McCall Richmond um, and the second from Jamie Payne. I also do also wish to point out that uh, since this item was added to the agenda and the report was distributed to members of council during the meeting, uh, the city clerk's office has received a number of email pieces of correspondence. Um, I think nine of them of which were attached to the material that was distributed to you tonight. And we've also since received at least one delegation request. So the additional delegation request is from Agnes uh, Zelkley. I think I've pronounced, I hope I pronounced her last name correctly. Uh, committee will need to a two thirds vote to uh, reopen the agenda to add her as a delegation. Okay, uh, so uh, members of the committee, um, we need a two-thirds vote. Um, is anybody, oh, Councillor Bowen, you'd like to ask a question? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. No, I'm just wondering procedurally, if is Councillor Santos on the call? Because she's the one who added this, uh, added this item, and if she's not on the call to talk to it, um, is, there, is there a point in us carrying on with it? That's all. Through you, Mr. Chair. So the item was properly added to the agenda. It's now within the purview of committee. So it's it's committee's item. It doesn't belong necessarily to one member of, of committee. Um, so it's a proper item before committee at this time, should committee choose to deal with it. Okay. Um, so we do, uh, however, we do need a two thirds vote. Um, uh, City Clerk, is this something that is this? This is not uh, recorded, is it? It's just a simple. Anyone oppose? Uh, let 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 us know. That's correct. Unless there is a request for a recorded vote, it can be just a simple. Okay. Anyone oppose? Okay. Does anybody then oppose us reopening uh, to allow uh, for an additional delegation? No. Okay. Back to you, City Clerk, uh, to proceed. So the, the first, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the first delegation is from Bruce McCall Richmond, who just, um, I will just bring into the meeting, just bear with me. So Bruce, you are in the meeting now. You can turn on your microphone and please proceed. You have uh, up to five minutes. Bruce, you can go ahead, please. Okay, while we're waiting for Bruce, uh, I will pull in uh, Jamie Payne. Uh, Jamie, can you please turn on your microphone? Jamie, can you please go ahead with your delegation? Your microphone's on. Hi there, my name is Jamie Payne, the project Humanity. Um, I've been walk, working on this file since December. Um, <clears throat> Bruce is going to speak more to the application. Um, I'm here more to speak on the habitat related questions. Um, we just also wanted to thank staff and um, all the councillors that have worked so hard on this file over the last three years. I know it was especially last week uh, quite a challenge to get it on the this agenda. So we really appreciate all the hard work that's been put forward on it. Um, and yeah, again, if I'm kind of more here to answer any habitat related questions after um, Bruce speaks to the actual application. Okay, thank you. Um, Bruce, can you please uh, try your microphone again? Bruce, your microphone is on now. Can you please proceed? 
Okay, Mr. Chair, I, I don't know if Bruce is present at the moment, so I'm going to bring in the added delegation, which is Agnes uh, Zikli. Um, Agnes, uh, you are now in the meeting. You can unmute your microphone, and you have up to five minutes. Agnes, your microphone's unmuted, so please go ahead. Agnes? Okay, Mr. Chair, I, uh, Agnes is in the meeting, as is Bruce McCall Richmond, and neither of their, micro their microphones are active, but uh, I'm not hearing anything from either of them, so there may be a connection issue. Mr. Chair, can we move along and maybe park this to the last part of the agenda? Good evening. Can council members hear me? Is that you, Agnes? Good evening. Agnes, can you hear me? So, Mr. Chair, I, I would, uh, I think that was Councillor Pileshi that spoke, so I think that's probably sound advice at this point is perhaps we stand this item down and move on to the next item and see if I can uh, establish the connection with Agnes and Bruce. Okay, so our next item then is 7.1 and it's a staff report regarding application to amend the zoning bylaw. Uh, Councillor Bowman pulled it out of... <laughs> Councillor Bowman pulled... Councillor Bowman, uh, go ahead. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, some technical difficulties in this uh, this high speed world we have. Um, I just have a couple of questions of staff. So I don't know uh, is Alan there? I guess is or or is Alan handling this file? Yeah. Hello. Hello through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, and through to Councillor Bowman. Yeah, Alan Parsons right right here. And also on on the call today, Councillor Bowman is uh, Miss Cynthia Odugima. She's our acting manager of development services and is the uh, the planner that was assigned to the file as well. Oh, okay. Well, if, yeah, sure. If Cynthia can answer the questions, that's wonderful. Um, the first question is, were all the letters sent out to all the people who had appeared at our last public meeting? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, all the names that were added through the two last meetings were notified through a planning follow-up letter process. Okay, and have any of them responded? Um, I see that we don't have any delegations tonight, which I found kind of surprising myself. Yeah, I haven't received any, um, any calls from the residents. There was only one uh, call that I think went through your office where um, there was a question as to whether the information can be sent to the public, but otherwise I haven't received one directly from myself. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make sure that all the notices were sent out to the, uh, to the neighbors around there and to those who attended the last meeting. I just wanted to make sure that. Uh, the other question I have centers around the uh, holding provision. Could you explain to me a little more what that holding provision is and what it means? Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. So the holding provision was put on because um, through the review uh, process, I know one of the issues that were raised by residents uh, was dealing with parking and traffic in the area. And through review with regional staff and uh, city staff from transportation, there were still some questions to be answered as to whether there was capacity and enough traffic improvement to support the overall development. So the idea is that um, based on numerous iteration to their traffic study, the townhouses were found to be accommodated within the existing traffic um, road network without um, requiring much changes to the road network at the moment. However, in order for the proposed um, building to go forward, we needed the applicant to explore further as to what additional revisions to the existing road network is needed to support it. And that's why the holding provision was put on so that 
they may be able to develop the town houses at the moment, and they need to continue working with staff to demonstrate that there will be no further issues with the proposed building before it proceeds. Okay, Cynthia, that that's my only concern. What happens if these traffic studies come back and they still can't justify that amount of traffic? What happens to the apartment or the condo complex? Does that turn into townhouses or does it get smaller? What happens in that case? Through you, Mr. Chair, so that's one of the um, questions we will have to resolve. Um, I do know though that I did have conversations with um, transportation staff to understand because one of the challenges was that um, they were looking to have a signal introduced on uh, Queen Street at Haggard. And uh, from our understanding, that may require additional land conveyances uh, from private ownership. And this requires a, a bit more work to be done. So staff were not necessarily concerned. They are very hopeful that the additional work that we're asking from the applicant should be able to support it. However, if it comes back, then it may be that we need to look at the design to see what can be accommodated without any further impact on the neighborhood. Okay, and final question, Cynthia. If it comes back and it's it's not, you know, it, it, it doesn't justify having that tower there and they need to change the proposal for the site, will is that a large enough change that it would necessitate another public meeting? So through, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Alan Parsons here, perhaps I can answer that for, for Councillor Bowman. So Councillor, yeah, the, the way in which the bylaw is, is posed now, uh, it, it identifies a permission for the, the 13 story building, but with the, the holding provision. If it is uh, somehow that the, the applicant isn't ultimately able to satisfy staff that a, a transportation impact study can be uh, approved for that 13 story, portion of the site that then they will have to rezone the site to something different and that will have to go through the, the public process uh, at this point in time though the the applicant uh, understands that uh, that the and it's actually their request that we proceed in this manner or rezone the the entirety of the site uh, we uh, allow some outright outright permissions for the stacked townhouses and we do utilize the holding provision for the 13 story building so they're they're uh, appreciating the fact that there could be a support from council for that and that the H would be lifted at a point in time in the future once they satisfy us on the traffic piece. Okay, thanks, Alan. And is there a, is this indefinitely or is there a time limit put on this hold? Through you, Mr. Chairman, there, there is no time limit associated with the hold. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bowman. Um, are there, as I don't see any further comments and uh, and uh, I'm gonna move that the chair be heard. Um, I do think, uh, I think just following Councillor Bowman's uh, train of thought and, and some of his questions, um, you know, I do find, uh, you know, my, my, and I do understand that planning staff, this is actually, uh, and we've done it with many other applications. Uh, so I do appreciate uh, um, the way that we can move applications forward and allow the applicant some time to complete uh, um, the application. But in this case, as I find the transportation study uh, critical to sort of the work that we're doing, and I am surprised that Councillor Bowman, uh, uh, like Councillor Bowman, sorry, that we did not get uh, anyone delegating tonight. Uh, and and um, I just have trouble believing knowing the calls I've received, and I'm sure Councillor Bowman himself as well, uh, so I'd like to move a deferral to next planning uh, uh, meeting to, uh, and I guess city clerk, if you can let us know when's the next planning meeting, is that in a month? Through you, Mr. Chair, the next planning meeting is September 14th, I believe. Um, but through oh. you, Mr. Chair, so um, a deferral move uh, motion should be moved at the outset when a, a member speaks. Oh, um, okay. So perhaps another member could move deferral on your behalf. I'll move it, Councillor Singh. So then through you, Mr. Chair, it would be a motion to defer to the September 14th Planning and Development Committee meeting. Okay, and that's not debatable, right? It is not, it goes to a vote immediately. Okay, can I get a recorded vote? Uh, thank you, uh, Peter.
recorded votes being requested on deferral of item 7.1 to the September 14th planning committee meeting. All in favor? Councillor Santos is absent. Councillor Vasante? In favor. Councillor Willens? Sure. Councillor Pileschi? Yeah. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Chair Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Singh? Yes. And Councillor Dillon is absent. Mr. Chair, that carries unanimously 8 to 0. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just for anyone who's on right now, there seems to be a, please uh, remind you to mute your, uh, your speaker. Uh, so we will go back now to the item on Habitat for Humanity. Uh, City Clerk, did you manage to uh, deal with some of the technical issues? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think we have. So I have uh, Bruce McCall Richmond, who I'm just going to unmute. Uh, Bruce, um, you have the floor for five minutes. Can you just test your microphone? Okay, thank you, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Well, excellent. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I won't get into details, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Bruce McCall Richmond, uh, planner with French Iron Associates. Uh, and I'm speaking out as the applicant on behalf of Habitat for Humanity. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thanks again to everyone for the last minute coordination and for uh, ensuring that this item was in fact on the agenda tonight um, for responding to my inquiry so quickly leading up to today. Uh, while this added, item was added uh, via motion, uh, it was originally intended to be on the agenda, uh, but as I understand from staff, there was actually another technical glitch uh, that prevented that from happening. Um, overall, uh, the project is on a very tight timeline uh, with respect to funding, and this is a, a critical a milestone for Habitat. Um, hence, I think the rush uh, to get this on the agenda today. Um, the application itself uh, has addressed all of the technical requirements um, to bring it to this stage uh, and before us tonight, um, as the staff report has demonstrated. Um, so once again, uh, thank you to staff and the councillor's office. Um, as it is a, a new item to, to many of you, I, if I may, I wanted to quickly address uh, the, the planning merits of the proposal uh, and speak to some of the resident comments um, that, I, that I was able to read uh, for council's information uh, to provide a level of assurance of where we are at this stage. Um, the application uh, it seeks to permit 12 stacked townhouses uh, in the downtown central area and on the south side of the terminus of William Street. Um, with respect to the amendment applications um, before us tonight, uh, the density adjustments sought to the Brampton downtown secondary plan, uh, they're required to permit the net density resulting after a, um, a significant land dedication uh, and protection of the natural area of the site, which is about 40% of the overall property. Uh, the stacked townhouse use is permitted by the, the official plan and the existing medium designation in the secondary plan. Uh, and the amendment to the secondary plan would not otherwise be required uh, save for the sizable um, natural area dedication. Uh, the zoning bylaw was required to rezone the property from the existing open space uh, zoning uh, to a townhouse zone to bring the site into conformity with the city's official plan. Um, and just for reference, the, the permitted net density is 50 units per hectare, um, whereas 70 is currently proposed. Without the dedication, it would be 41 uh, UPH or units per uh, hectare. Um, and respect, with respect to the traffic comments, um, it, it's always a significant concern, and we should always, of course, take it seriously. As we all know, uh, the extension of William Street itself uh, will provide a 10-meter public right-of-way um, 10 meter wide public right of way uh, with it, uh, approximately 40 meters in length. Uh, the extension includes all elements of a new public road, uh, and services, drainage, uh, 1.5 meter sidewalk, uh, while also providing that this development with a public street frontage um, and also a connection to a private internal road uh, that will serve the townhouses and provide access to the rear of the, the building. Um, the BA group did the traffic study. Uh, they assessed the proposal uh, and they, they found that the, the 12 units will generate very minimal uh, increase in traffic. 
Um, as for parking quickly, uh, there are 13 spaces provided, uh, 12 of which for, are for residents, uh, one for visitors. Um, the parking study also prepared by VA, VA group also demonstrates um, no adverse impacts and that the parking is suitable to service the proposed development. A um, couple of other thoughts uh, quickly, the extension of William Street itself uh, will generate additional opportunities for street parking on one side, as it is now. Um, the property is in the downtown area, it's, it's walkable, it's well served by transit um, within a major transit station area, as we know, downtown. And um, I, I'd be happy to share the study with residents if they have any further questions about that. And um, lastly, quickly, uh, I don't know if I have much time. Um, I would like to touch on urban design. Uh, the, the building itself has been designed to complement the heritage homes at 18 and 22 William Street. Um, a study was done uh, to address these homes and to provide input on the scale, height, and material palette that should be used for this building, uh, while also ensuring that there's no visual impact uh, to the heritage uh, resource uh, buildings there. This project also went to the Urban Design Review Panel. Um, it was commented on and, and scrutinized uh, by the panel members, which is great and good. And it's good to get comments like that. Um, but it, the, the Urban Design Brief um, for this project has since been approved. Uh, we've been able to incorporate a number of the panel's comments. Um, and, and we're at this stage now of uh, hopefully uh, having council's support for approval. Um, uh, so, just to conclude, and I'll wrap up now, I don't want to get too much into the technical details, but this application is for 12, 12 stack townhouses in the city's downtown area. Um, the homes are intended for Habitat's uh, affordable home ownership program. Uh, and from a planning perspective, uh, this is an excellent location for affordable housing. Uh, it's ideally located and in proximity to a wide range of transit services uh, amenities. Uh, it, it contributes to the regional and city objectives for affordable housing, uh, specifically options for affordable home ownership. And I think uh, that it will be a benefit to the community and surrounding area. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to address any questions. But I'll end it there. Thank you very much again. Okay, City Clerk, I think you had another delegation. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. The next delegation is from Agnes. Uh, Zeekly and Agnes, you are unmuted now, so you should, your microphone should work. Please go ahead. Good evening, council members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, council members. Thank you very much for taking the time to hear us. Um, I am a little bit, um, <laughs> sorry. We have been trying very hard one to get on as a delegate. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the history. We did receive the letter over a week ago in the neighborhood uh, regarding this meeting that the uh, recommendation record will be added on to the, tonight's agenda. And um, some of our neighbors, first of all, have not received the letter. And also, as soon as we received, we have been asking Cynthia Wusu almost on a daily basis um, to s send us the report or a copy of the link uh, for the report and to let us know if this item will be added onto the agenda. At this point, I would like to let every council member know that I received this recommendation record this morning at 7.49 a.m. And I found out at 7 o'clock this evening that this item was added onto the agenda for approval. I don't feel that I have the support of the council to be heard and to hear our side of the story. We understand Habitat wants to move into our neighborhood but you don't understand what we are living through. This is a small street, downtown Main Street uh, and William Street. And this is a small street where we have already an old age home that has multiple paramedic trucks coming in and out to take care of our elderly on the street. And we, we only have one side of the street that has a sidewalk when there's deliveries for the old age home or for anyone else or garbage trucks, I can actually provide you videos of what our street looks like. I don't know when in November that survey was taken on our street for traffic because, or for parking, but I have been recording multiple times what our street actually looks like. And if I was given the proper time to prepare for this meeting, I would have been able to show you 
what our street actually looks like. The fact that someone says that there's only six cars on the street when all our neighbors can protest and tell you that we have more than cars, multiple housing on the street can attest that there's always more cars. Agnes, I think your phone is, is your connection's breaking up. Can you just uh, make sure you're in a stable location with a good signal? So you are not able to hear our, our side out. You're just jumping to conclusions. I'm asking all council members to reconsider your approval on this. We don't have a council member on our side right now. We are all alone because none of our council members are supporting our side of the story. One of them has to remove himself because he owns a property on the street. I understand that, but I am asking Jeff, please support us. The same thing that you're fighting for in your zone, we need a council member to fight for us, to hear our side, to support us. This is important. 12 units on our street will destroy us. We have kids that we need to drive to school back and forth. The traffic on the sidewalk will will not will be not efficient. I'm sorry, I am upset because as you can tell, I didn't have enough time to prepare for this. I only found that at nine o'clock at night that I might be able to work uh, to delegate this. I. Uh, <laughs> working from my cell phone with technology that is not always 100%. I'm really hoping that you can hear me. And all I'm asking for you to not rush this. I am asking you, why are you rushing it? Why are you jumping so quickly to make a decision? Why is this, why is this so urgent? We are under COVID-19. I am asking you to take a step back, relax, and let's revisit this when all of us can properly look through this survey the report and make sure that every everything is looked at and all sides are heard. Please, I am asking you to please reconsider. Again, thank you. My name is Agnes CK. I do live on the street and I really do hope that you can hear my, uh, hear my plea and delay this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Agnes. Um, just uh, city clerk, can you just remind uh, for those who are viewing today and, and especially to Agnes, in terms of our decision today uh, and when it uh, gets finalized, because I, I think sometimes people don't understand there's a ratification process. Uh, so this is just, I guess, would be step one uh, into approval. And then after there's a final sort of uh, uh, approval process. So if you can just maybe walk Agnes through it. Through, yes, certainly through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, this is a, the Planning and Development Committee, which is a standing committee of council, and it uh, is charged with making recommendations, not final decisions. So tonight it is making recommendations, and those recommendations will be encapsulated in a set of minutes that will be presented to City Council, full City Council, next Wednesday, August 5th. And at that meeting next week, Council will consider these recommendations and may make a final decision on this matter. Uh, they may choose to do another course of action as well. So. Uh, interested members of the public um, that feel that they haven't had an opportunity to participate in this uh, can do have an opportunity next week to either write or to request to delegate at council next week in regard to this matter. Okay, thank you, uh, City Clerk. Um, so as we have no further delegations, uh, members of the committee, are there any uh, questions or comments uh, for uh, uh, regarding this report to, to staff? No, and I guess to our city clerk, um, in terms of the mover of the motion, who is not on the board, uh, is this still properly, uh, can we consider this motion and read the motion? Through you, Mr. Chair, there needs to be a new mover of the motion as Councillor Santos is not present at the moment. Okay, so I'm not sure then, uh, are there any members of committee uh, who would like to move this motion? I'll do it, Councillor Singh. Okay, Councillor Singh has uh, moved the motion. 
to report to approve the report recommendations and receive the delegations that the report titled recommendation report application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw habitat for humanity gta 25 William Street to the Planning Development Committee meeting of July 27, 2020 be received. That the official plan and zoning by law amendment application submitted by Habitat for Humanity GTA uh, on behalf of Mesed Mesedal Holdings Incorporated, Ward 1, as refined, be approved on the basis that it represents good planning, including that it's consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the growth plan for the Golden Greater Horseshoe, that the Region Appeal official plan and the city's official plan, that the amendments to the Downtown Brampton Secondary Plan Area 7 generally in accordance with Appendix 12 to this report be adopted, that the amendments to the zoning bylaw generally in accordance with the Appendix 13 to this uh, report be adopted. No further notice or public meeting be required by the Attach official plan amendment and zoning by law amendment pursuant to the Planning Act as amended. Uh, that the delegations with regard to this item be received. Is there anyone who uh, opposes this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Okay, there's no objections, so the motion carries. Uh, we go on now to uh, everything's been in consent. Uh, and now we go on to no new business. Referred matters. Three, uh, Mr. Chair. Do any through you, Mr. Chair, item oh. seven seven point six is not on consent. Uh, proposed oh, amendment one apologies. to the place to grow growth plan. Yeah, and and my apologies. So we do have a staff report regarding a place to grow growth plan for the golden uh, golden horseshoe and the proposed land needs assessment methodology. Are there any uh, questions? Uh, do members have any uh, questions about the report? No. Okay. I have a motion moved by Councilor Vicente to approve. Uh, the report recommendations that the recommendation report titled city of branch response to proposed amendment one to a place to grow growth plan for the golden uh, golden horseshoe and the proposed land needs assessment methodology be received that the comments responding to the ministry of municipal affairs and housing regarding proposed amendment to a place to grow growth plan for the golden golden horseshoe and the proposed land needs assessment methodology included as appendix a and b to the report be submitted as the city of brampton's formal response that a copy of this report be sent to the region appeal uh, for information. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Uh, now we go on to referred matters. Is there any, uh, do members have any questions regarding the referred matters list? No, we go on to the next item. Uh, so correspondence, I believe all this has been moved. Uh, and we are now at... 13.2, Mr. Chair, is correspondence on the Williams Parkway reconstruction project. 13.2 okay uh so i do have are there any questions regarding this correspondence okay i have a motion moved by councillor Palashi to receive the correspondence um that uh, correspondence from david lang member of the brampton environment advisory committee to the planning and development committee meeting of july 27th uh, regarding williams parkway reconstruction project be received is there anyone opposed to this motion no okay uh and so we move on to councillor question period are there any members of uh have any questions regarding the community services section uh my apologies regarding the planning uh section no okay uh we'll move on public question period um city clerk are there any questions from the public uh, Mr. Chair, there are no questions related to items. There, there were questions that were I sent in the form of correspondence through email in regards to item 9.1, but that item has been addressed at this point. Thank you uh, very much, uh, City Clerk. And now we move on. There's no uh, closed session tonight, and now we go on to adjournment. Uh, our next uh, committee meeting is September 14th at 7 p.m. I have a motion moved by Councillor Willens to adjourn tonight's meeting. That the Planning Development Committee do now adjourn to meet again on Monday, September 14th at 7 p.m. or at the call of the chair. Is there anyone opposed? Thank you. No objections. So the motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, practice physical distancing and wear face covering when inside public spaces. Uh, good evening, everybody. <laughs>